Man, I love that saxophone, and I love Pajama Sam, and I'm not the only one judging by the overwhelming majority of viewers that write comments who have explicitly told me that Pajama Sam is their favorite humongous entertainment franchise without question. For one reason or another, it seems that Sam still remains above the rest of the Junior Adventure franchises as the most beloved and fondly remembered. Originally thought of by none other than Humongous Entertainment co-founder Ron Gilbert himself, Pajama Sam is a young, presumably elementary school-aged boy who looks up to his favorite comic book hero, Pajama Man, who battles nefarious evildoers and rescues the world from the clutches of evil. Having had a slew of adventure titles and a handful of spin-offs to boot, it's it's pretty apparent Pajama Sam was yet another successful humongous entertainment franchise. A lot of people love Pajama Sam, and I think I've determined one of the main reasons as to why that is. Unlike Freddy Fish and Putt-Putt, who are fictional characters based on things that can't actually speak and behave like a human, Pajama Sam himself is a kid. He's the easiest of the junior adventure characters for a kid to identify with because of this pre-existing commonality between them. Kids have a tendency to relate and connect with other kids their own age. And then of course, there's the creative and iconic imagination settings of things like the Land of Darkness, the Weather Factory, and the Isle of Mop Top. They're all fantastic, yet built upon such a simple concept that carries a lot of weight for children at young ages, commonly feared occurrences. I mean, what kid wasn't scared of the dark at least one point in their lives. Thunder and lightning can be pretty scary too, and picky eaters? Don't even get me started on them. All common fears that hundreds of thousands of children encounter during their lives, and that gives Pajama Sam yet another edge over other adventure titles. Not only are these exciting environments to explore, they're mechanisms to personify conceptual fears into harmless, friendly incarnations that aim to build confidence in children so that they are trained to not fear these things. It takes something that could otherwise be scary and makes it fun, and that is what makes Pajama Sam so special. That is its signature belief. Although, it's funny, Sam didn't originally start out as the red-caped pajama-wearing kid hero that many came to love. Nah, in fact, he started out as Pumpkinhead Boy, an intrepid lad with a pumpkin for a head. Yeah, needless to say, that didn't come to fruition, and it was actually a result of Humongous' marketing department at the time explaining to Ron that a character like that would come across as too seasonal. Sure, it'd probably do well around Halloween, but during other times of the year, not so much. It was a novel concept, but it was for the best that that change was made. And so, Pajama Sam came to be. I've been really looking forward to this one, debatably the most out of every video I'm making in this series. And despite the fact that I've already recorded this entire video once and ended up losing the files after four hours of recording and six hours of audio editing, I'm going to do my best to re-record all of this for your viewing pleasure, and hopefully it doesn't fail on me this time. I'm excited, so let's get things started. Strap yourselves in for a journey into the imagination as we take a look at the junior adventures of Pajama Sam, a humongous entertainment retrospective. All right, I'm ready for action. All right, darkness, here comes Pajama Sam! Well, boys and girls, they've finally done it. After a multitude of adventure games prior to this moment, Humongous Entertainment has finally found the perfect formula for their computer software with Pajama Sam in No Need to Hide when it's dark outside. No Need to Hide, aka Pajama Sam 1, is the first junior adventure game ever to simultaneously allow its players to tackle any item they want in any order they wish, and provide multiple spawn locations for each required item necessary to beat the game. 
That's right, true open-ended freedom is finally achieved in Pajama Sam 1, and I couldn't be happier. The best of the best adventure games, in my opinion, are the ones where I am given complete control over which objectives I want to prioritize, as well as the choice for how I want to go about obtaining them, and the added replayability makes for a longer-lasting experience because I'll likely get a different pathway the next time I play the game. But I'll be getting into that after we go over the premise for the first Pajama Sam title, and my personal favorite entry in the entire series. I'm just throwing that out there now. Whether or not I consider it the best game is another thing entirely, but it's my personal favorite as I have the fondest memories of this game out of all the entries in the Pajama Sam franchise, and I'm sure I'll get into the stories I have as this section of the video goes along. Just as a brief side note before we begin, the voice of Sam just so happens to be Pamela Adlin herself, a voice that many older players might instantly recognize as the voice of Bobby from King of the Hill. Hey, Peters! You giving my friend here a hard time? Back off. This is none of your business, Bobby. Oh, I'm making it my business, Peters. And yes, it's literally the exact same voice. While most people will probably be unable to unhear Bobby when listening to Sam, for me, it's actually the opposite. Sam was the first encounter I ever had with hearing Pamela Adlin in a voice acting role, and as such, when I first heard Bobby Hill several years later, my mind was absolutely blown. I had never watched the show at that point, so to hear her voice again after such a long gap in time since I had played the last Pajama Sam game, that made my day. But I digress. The premise of Pajama Sam 1 begins with Sam reading a comic book right before bed about his all-time favorite superhero and role model, Pajama Man. In the latest issue, he's taking on the master of evil, Darkness himself. Right in the middle of the action, Sam's mother interrupts him and tells him that tonight's the night he's finally going to go to sleep with the lights off. And while Sam may be confident that he can handle it at first, that confidence quickly fades as he finds himself sitting there alone in his room with darkness and shadows as they begin to creep up the walls and all over the ceiling, instilling that deep-rooted fear of the night inside of him. It is in this moment that he decides to channel his inner pajama man and conquer darkness once and for all by using his trusty flashlight, his limited edition all-metal Pajama Man lunchbox and his mask to take on the vicious fiend. This is a job for Pajama Sam. Now where's my Pajama Sam mask? I need that and my flashlight and my lunchbox. I'm sure that my stuff's in here somewhere. Although, he's got to find them first, and this is where the tutorial of the game comes into play. Sam's Room Yes, as with Putt-Putt Joins the Parade, the first Pajama Sam game comes with a tutorial sequence that teaches the player how to play the game. Click. On. Everything. The player is tasked with searching around the room, clicking on various things and locations that may have Sam's items hidden underneath or inside of them. It's a nifty way to immediately toss the player into the game by encouraging exploration. This game has so many hidden secrets scattered about, and the one way for them to be found is by being clicked on. The player can click on various toys he has scattered about, the poster above his bed, and even the image of Freddy Fish located in the top right corner of his room. Because this wouldn't be a humongous entertainment game without references to their other intellectual properties, right? After some poking around, the player eventually finds Sam's three items scattered around his bedroom, and with the preparation out of the way, he's finally ready to take on darkness. He peeks into his closet only for a door to slam behind him, knocking him off his feet and falling in a downward spiral until he impacts onto the ground and finds himself lost in a mysterious world. Welcome to the Land of Darkness. Ouch. Wow, this looks like where darkness lives all right. I better go find him before mom notices I'm gone. Well, there's no turning back now. This may very well end up being the longest segment of time I spend on any single humongous game because I just have loads and loads and loads and loads to talk about with this game in particular. Pajama Sam games have a tendency to put a heavier emphasis on environments and world building, and given the nature of these games, that leads to a lot of minute details and noteworthy talking points that will incur quite the interesting discussion. 
As such, there will probably be more spoilery things revealed on these games compared to my discussions of, say, the Putt-Putt and Freddy Fish titles, but that's a sacrifice I'm willing to make for the sake of making this video as in-depth as it can possibly be. So, the very first detail worth noting with Pajama Sam 1 is that the game takes place in this fantasy world called The Land of Darkness, which is established with Sam's dramatic entrance from falling into his closet. Within the game itself, it's never acknowledged where this mysterious land is or how Sam has the ability to somehow warp to it, but anybody with a keen eye for detail is likely to piece everything together based on the scattered yet recognizable items that fill up the background. This game is taking place inside Sam's own imagination. What we see here is not the reality of what's happening. It's Sam running around inside his own imagination as he tries to conceptualize and personify the adventure he's having while he attempts his own inner focus to get over his fear. We will see this exact same concept in the sequels as well, but it's more apparent in this title than the others because of those background elements. Given that the very first room of the game provides context clues through the miscellaneous items lying around, such as the baseball equipment or the drawers extending off this tree, it is evident that this is the case. Back in my day, they didn't even have video games. Tell me that doesn't sound like an elderly version of Video Game Donkey. From there, Sam progresses onto the next room where he encounters a floating piece of wood drifting in the stream he runs over. This, of course, introduces the concept of backtracking into the game, as No Need to Hide has been designed with the intent of having the player fully explore the Land of Darkness by suggesting they observe their surroundings, yet prevent them from fully accessing everything the first time they visit. The game wants to encourage the returning to the same location multiple times after having completed tasks at other points in the game in order to get the player to think. When the player comes across this screen, they notice the driftwood and mentally think to themselves, okay, so here's a problem I can't solve right now. I should probably look for a potential item I can use to help me solve this so that I can come back later. We'll be getting to more examples of this situation shortly. Next, Sam dashes on to the adjacent room where he encounters some security guards with a joke that completely flew over my head as a kid. <laughs> Whoa! Customs, customs, inspection. Well, 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 what have we here? Hey. Oh, like a flashlight and a signature edition all metal pajama man lunchbox. Did you declare these before entering the land of darkness, young man? Declare? Well, no, I guess not. I, um... I think we'd better confiscate these items. They could be dangerous. And thus, the trees have taken Sam's belongings and scattered them across the land of darkness, so now Sam needs to go get them back before he can take on darkness once and for all. This encounter acts as the setup for the majority of the gameplay going forward. From here, the player is given the objective of acquiring the items they just lost while being given the complete and total freedom to go wherever they want. They can use the rope they just acquired from freeing Sam from the tree to run back and get that floating plank from the water for starters, or they can continue forward to the nexus to see what all the land has to offer. This nexus, by the way, is probably the most iconic room in the entire game, with the gigantic dark tree and the bold red leaves looming over a tiny, tiny Sam in the bottom left corner. The intimidating presence of darkness truly gets conveyed here, and with Sam's imagination personifying him as this big, bad entity, it only makes sense that he would have some kind of evil lair. This nexus also presents the player with two additional pathways they could travel down. To the left they find the mines, and to the right lies the boat dock. Now, in all reality, the player technically can't access the content within the mines until they do travel down the boat dock path, but should they go to the mines first, it would tie into that same scenario as the floating piece of driftwood. It acts as a peek into a future portion of the game that the player is incentivized to access by finding the way to open that lock, an important objective that the player can remember for later. I personally always went to the boat dock first as a kid, seeing as that's just how I've always played the game, but nothing's stopping you from going to Darkness's house first all the same. In going to the boat dock, Sam comes across Otto, a sad little wooden boat staring down into the water, explaining to Sam that he's afraid to jump in because of a friend that told him he would sink to the bottom and drown. Would you give me a ride across the river? Oh no! I can't go in the water, I think. i made of wood, you know. But wood floats. No, I don't think so. I had this friend and he told me this story about his dentist brother who, um, he was made of wood and he got in the water and he sank. Really? 
straight through the bottom. It's so scary. I wish I'd been a car. I think your friend was wrong. Wood floats in the water. Oh, I wish that were true. Of course, Sam, in hearing this information, knows how ridiculous he sounds and explains that wood floats in water. However, Otto is adamant on not believing him simply on the basis of his own fear as to what could happen. This is where that wooden plank comes into play, as the player should recollect that they saw a piece of wood floating in water just a little bit ago. Should they have not gone back for the board yet, this is the hint for them to go back and acquire it in order to help Otto overcome his fear. So, whether or not the player's already acquired the board, the objective needs to be complete first in order to assist Otto with his troubles so that you may traverse across the stream and see what else lies beyond. A basic starting puzzle. Funnily enough, when the player acquires the plank, Sam actually loses the rope that he used to do so, which activates an optional dialogue chain with the blue tree that lended it to him, which brings in another point that I love about this game. Optional conversations. This tree? Um, I'm sorry, but I, uh, I lost the rope you let me borrow. Rope? Oh, that's alright, I can probably get a new one. You're not mad? Yeah, actually it's kind of a relief not to have to hold that rope up all day long. No Need to Hide is full of these optional conversations where you can actually talk to characters just for the heck of it and get all sorts of dialogue from them that you wouldn't hear just by doing the mandatory tasks needed to beat the game. The tree is actually very polite about Sam losing the rope, even stating that it's probably a relief because now she won't have to hold it up all the time. It doesn't make Sam feel bad about his mistake, despite him worrying about it with his initial reaction when he realizes he lost it. This is a good thing because it shows kids that owning up to your mistakes isn't a bad thing necessarily, and you should let other people know when you accidentally do something to their property because most of the time, they are going to be understanding of the situation. And then of course, there's also the other conversation with the tree. Hi, how you doing? Pretty good, how about you? I can't complain. That's good. It's against the rules. Oh. Oh, and I also wanted to mention this now while I had the opportunity. Within the game lies an optional collectible in the form of Sam's dirty socks, 20 of which are all scattered around the land of darkness. Collect them all and you get to see a special scene where Sam's socks go into the washing machine for a deep cleansing, something his mother asked him to be on the lookout for at the beginning of the game. It doesn't do anything really, it's just bragging rights more than anything else, but it does tie into a future game, so this is something worth remembering later on in the video. Anyways, after acquiring the rope and heading back to Otto, you can throw the plank in the water to prove to him he has nothing to worry about. What's cool is that there are actually two different ways that this scene can play out. You can either sit down and listen to Otto's story first and then put the plank in the water, or if you already know the solution, you can throw the plank in the water before even talking to him and you end up getting two different dialogue chains as a result. Okay, check this out. It's wood, right? Yes. All right, now watch. <laughs> See, it floats. Wood floats. Yeah? So you'll float too. Go on, give it a try. I guess. <laughs> hey, what was that that you just threw into the water? Just an old piece of wood, why? It's floating. Wood floats in water? Sure, didn't you know that? Uh, I had this friend who told me about someone he knew who was wood and who sank in the water, so I was afraid to go into the, the water because I thought I'd sink too because I made the wood, but now I can see that wood floats, so maybe I don't have to be afraid anymore. Uh Remember when I touched upon this in Putt-Putt Saves the Zoo where conversations would change based on who you interacted with? It's a similar principle here which makes replaying the game all the more exciting because you could potentially get different conversations from playthrough to playthrough based on how you go upon handling the different scenarios in the game. But. Back to Otto. I think what I really like about including a moment where Sam has to help another character overcome its fear is a clever kind of way to represent Sam's own conscience attempting to justify him tackling his own fear. It's like Otto essentially represents his attempt to convince himself that conquering his fear can be a good thing through a fact that he already knows. Sam knows that wood floats, but Otto doesn't, so Sam shows him that it does in order to prove his fear is irrational. This could be interpreted as Sam's own interpretation of a conversation he may have had with his mother at one point regarding him going to sleep with the lights off. 
It's subtle but clever, and that could be said for practically everything in this game. It's little moments, details like these why I love it the most out of the series. Not that the other games don't have clever designs and inclusions, just wait and see, believe me they do, but No Need to Hide is the most effective in my eyes when it comes to conveying deeper ideas and meaning. So far, so good. Well, here goes nothing. I'm doing it! I'm floating! Yahoo! Oh boy, this is great! Can I give you a ride somewhere? Come on, hop in! Once you gain access to Otto, he is capable of taking you down river so that you can explore other areas in the land. This includes a pathway across the stream to the wishing well, which is blocked off by some racist trees that will only let other trees pass through. Hold! Just where do you think you are going? Um, nowhere really, I just wanted to pass by. Just barging through like that? Without even asking permission? Have you no manners? It is customary to- Oh no, this isn't another customs inspection, is it? Are you gonna take all my stuff? I assure you, we have no interest in your stuff. Phew, that's a relief. I'm sorry if I offended you. May I pass through? No. No? This is an exclusive road. It's for trees only. Out of the way! You let him go by? Well, that's different. Yes, he's a tree. This path is for trees only. Look at that. Humongous entertainment teaching kids that racism is bad since 1996. No, but seriously, racism is bad. Once the player makes it through, however, there is a 50-50 shot of coming across Sam's mask as it rests around this carrot. However, it's not just any old carrot, it's a peace-loving, good vibes, liberation, hippie carrot. This mask belongs to the people. It sure looks like my mask. Property is theft, man. Anyway, I need the mask to protect my identity as the leader of the Salad Liberation Front. The what? The Salad Liberation Front. We're a group of veggies fighting against the core system. We're tired of being relegated to the salad. We want to be the main course. Whatever, I just want my mask back. And I just gotta say, I love this guy. He's hysterically funny to listen to. The actor that plays him gets so into it. And he's a stapled character in the series that will be returning in future titles, so it's apparent that I wasn't the only one that loved this guy. He goes on to Sam about needing to rescue a bunch of carrots from Darkness's fridge and agrees to let Sam have his mask back if he agrees to help rescue his vegetable brethren. Sam, of course, thinks this is all ridiculous, but just goes along with it anyways because he needs to get his mask back by any means necessary. On certain playthroughs, you may also end up seeing Sam's lunchbox located next to the well, which has been walled off by a briar patch. In order to get around it, you'll actually need to take a different passageway, so for the time being, there's no easy way to truly obtain it. If the lunchbox isn't there, however, you can simply walk on through and speak to one of the best characters in the entire game, The Wishing Well. My name's Sam. You can call me Exo Gomper. Where'd you get a name like that? I didn't say it was my name. I just said you could call me that, if you want to. Oh, uh, thanks. This guy is the most sarcastic character I think to exist in any humongous game, and by Jove, he is a riot to boot. Every line of dialogue out of this guy is witty, snappy, and amusing to the fullest degree. As a kid, I never really understood this guy's shtick, but now that I'm older, I think he's absolutely hilarious. Where did that water go? Why, into the hole, of course! After the water goes down the hole, what happens to it? It makes a stream underneath us, and then the bucket brings it back up again. Why do you pour the water down the hole if you're just gonna bring it up again? We have to pour the water down the hole to make the stream! Why do you have to make a stream? Silly! If we didn't make the stream, we wouldn't have a source of water! So the only reason you're making this stream is so you'll have water to make the stream? What are you trying to do, put me out of a job? No, it just seems sort of silly. That's because you're not a trained professional like me. I see. I love how this guy literally traps Sam in a never-ending loop by answering his questions while also laughing at the absurdity that this guy is literally contributing nothing whatsoever without a care in the world. Good stuff. Good stuff. 
Heading back to the river and going southeast, we come across a field of geysers and other colored oozes that have some exceptional sound design, I just gotta say. There's not much to really do here as of yet, except get a two and a half minute long lecture from Otto about the scientific background of geysers, so it's best to head back the other direction that you came in. What did you say that thing was called? That's a geyser. A what? A geyser. It's kind of a hot spring that spurts up water and steam every so often. It works kind of like a coffee percolator. Water in passages deep down where the rocks are hot gets heated up to the point where it would normally turn into steam, except it doesn't because of the pressure of all the other water on top of it. So it gets really hot and it expands and it pushes some of the colder water out of the top. That relieves the pressure and all of a sudden the hot water turns into steam and POW! It erupts out along with all the colder water on top. Then more water flows down into the deep passages, and the whole thing starts all over again. No, seriously, get out of there before this goes on any longer. As a kid, I thought this went on for an hour, when in reality it's just a few minutes long, but I guess that's what it's like when you have a short attention span, and... But enough about me. Tell me about you. Well, my name's Timmy. I have a short attention span, and... <laughs> Then of course that leaves the Northwest, which leads the player to a bridge that they cannot access until they are able to pay the toll of one pound of gold. And if that seems a little absurd for a toll fee, believe me, Sam likes to make that very well known to the bridge. Don't you think a whole pound of gold is kind of a lot for a bridge toll? Supply and demand. This is the only way to get over to the park, so take it or leave it. Know what I mean? I guess so. What's to stop someone else from putting up another bridge here, charging less than a pound of gold to go across, and driving you out of business? Hey, what's going on here? You trying to weasel in on my territory? I wouldn't advise it. I've got friends. Powerful friends. I see. Again, the writing in this game has some very clever lines that I never understood as a kid that I only get now, and it's just made me come to appreciate all of the hard work and effort that went into making this game even more accessible than I realized when I was younger. It's solid work, but seeing as there's nothing more to do for the time being, it's best to carry on down the river to the old shack located next to the waterfall. On some playthroughs, this shack may have a handle on it, while in other players it may not. This essentially serves as an indicator on whether or not the flashlight is locked inside. You also need to grab the oil can that's sitting next to the door so that you can A, loosen the hinges to make it easier to open, and B, to return to the mines. So just keep that in the back of your head. This was actually the spawn location that I had rolled on my first playthrough, by the way. Should the flashlight not be present inside the shack, the hammer item will be instead, which Sam holds on to for later. From here, there's only one direction left to go. Traversing down the waterfall leads you into this super atmospheric cavern full of deep blues and purples as a reverb echoes through the cave and water drips down from the ceiling. This area in particular always stands out to me. I love how soothing the tune of the music is. So much that I could actually fall asleep just listening to this. It's so soothing, so atmospheric. This also happens to be the other spawn location for Sam's lunchbox, so keep that in mind. Again, this was the location I had rolled on my first playthrough. Continuing through the cavern eventually brings you to this geyser room, which probably looks a little familiar to those that decided to go right on the river first. Floating on over to the middle of the room allows the geyser to launch you straight up into the air, through the ceiling, and back out to where you saw it from the other side, completing the loop. 
and discovering this for the first time as a kid absolutely blew my mind. The fact that the team at Humongous purposefully designed this sequence to complete a full circle was absolutely stunning to me as a kid. Should the lunchbox be blocked from Sam's path on the other end of the river, by the way, there would be a hole in the ceiling with a bucket being dropped down in the central room of the cavern, showcasing how this area actually loops around in one big circle, as this is where the wishing well can be accessed in order to obtain the lunchbox by going through the central path directly across from the river. Do you follow all that? It's a little strange to think about geographically, but if you actually do understand the layout of the map, it makes perfect sense. Anyhow, that completes Otto's area for the most part. The second prominent location that branches off from the Nexus is seen with the Mines, which is home to an old minecart named King who's unfortunately been rusted to the track for a good number of years, incapable of moving from the spot that he's stuck in. I'm Pajama Sam! I'm gonna capture darkness and put him in a lunchbox! That's great. My name's Mud. Really? No, not really. Then why did you say it is? Look, I, I'm sorry, kid. I'm just real depressed is all. See, I, I used to roll all over the place on this here track. Up, down, sideways, loop to loop, put a fun I had. But then I got rushed. Rust? Yeah, rust. See, my wheels are rusted stiff, so I'm stuck right here on this spot. Can't move at all. Gee, that's too bad. Yeah, especially in summer when the pigeons come down here for some shade. Luckily, thanks to the oil can that Sam picked up while he was out with Otto, he can free King from the track and grant him the freedom to move again, thus allowing the player to go on a wild minecart ride and explore the vast innards of the deep, deep mines. Another aspect of this game's visuals department that I strongly admire is the contrast between King and Otto's sections of the game. While traveling down the river with Otto, the water and environments have a lot of heavy blues and greens that give off a rather cool feeling to the environment. I imagine the outside of the Land of Darkness is this calming, comfortable temperature. I can envision myself feeling this slight breeze in the air as I float on down the stream. Compare that to the deep, thick reds and oranges that make up the lava-filled mine shafts and things suddenly take a dramatic shift towards the warmth. I get this visceral sensation of speed and adrenaline while a mild heat emanates off of the walls around me. There are some pretty notable rooms in this section too, especially with the gold mine which acts sort of like a reaction sequence where it's on the player to click on the route they want to take fast enough before King automatically goes down the default direction. It actually takes about three runs through the gold mine sequence to see every room there is to see, and what's really cool about it is that you can actually traverse outside of the mines in brief sections where you can see the cavern you floated through with Otto, as well as the outside of Darkness's house. There's also this old arcade machine hidden behind one of the pathways that lets you play a variation of the game Snake, featuring a minecart similar to King that requires you to move around the four directions and pick up the various crystals without crashing into a wall or the own chain that you consistently build. It's a cool little minigame, a fun side distraction, but completely optional. Two out of the three pathways will also have Sam wind up by the gold he needs in order to get across the bridge. Just make sure you grab the pickaxe first before entering this section, otherwise you won't be able to extract it from the wall. I warned you to be careful. Yeah, but look at all this gold I got. Since you're fabulously rich, uh, how about sharing the wealth a little? Say, let me have the small piece, huh? Deal. The other noteworthy attraction that's prominent in the mines is in the second room you enter after starting your minecart ride, which may or may not have this cave that's gated off by these wooden boards. This is the second possible pathway you can follow in order to obtain Sam's flashlight, although even if you manage to gather the hammer inside the shed by the waterfall, you still won't get very far because you'll come across this solid wall with connect the dots written all over it. Wait, we give uncle, uncle. I was tired of that job anyway. Do you think darkness will be mad? 
Ah, uh, he never comes down here. In order to get past this obstacle, you actually need to go to that bridge that's requiring you to pay the toll in order to get across using the gold acquired in that minecart section. Doing so will bring you to a room centered around cheese and crackers, a total knockoff of tic-tac-toe that the game is fully aware of, but brushes off as though they have no idea what Sam's talking about. Hey, this is like tic-tac-toe. Tic-tac who? No, no, this is cheese and crackers. This is where Sam can recruit this pencil character who acts as an item just like Carrot, as he just lounges around complaining that his construction crew left him there to die with no possible way of finding them. Since he's out of luck, he agrees to accompany Sam in his quest to vanquish darkness, although Humongous must not have been as invested in this character because, unlike Carrot, this is the only game he ever appears in. I'm not really upset by that because I don't really care for him either, but still, it's cool that you at least get another character to bounce off of. Even still, What's funny to me is that because he and Carrot are treated like actual inventory items, they can be used on various different click points within the game itself. Granting the player access to specific cutscenes cater directly to them that are utterly inaccessible otherwise. For instance, there's a book in Darkness's library where Sam mentions that if he had a pencil, he'd be able to write a poem inside of it. Well, it turns out that if you actually take the pencil and use it on that book, Sam will write out a poem. What's this? A poem? Shh, I'm working. Oh, okay. Anyone can write a poem. Why don't you try just to show them? Bye, Sam. Pretty neat, right? Well, anyways, take the pencil back to the cave and connect the dots, and the rest of his construction crew should show up to destroy the wall, allowing you to continue on through. But if you thought the puzzle was over and the flashlight could be obtained from there, Boy, are you mistaken. Instead, this takes you through a secret portion of the mines exclusive for this item spawn location, and when I was a kid, I actually didn't know about this area for the longest time. Why is that? Well, for some strange reason as a kid, whenever I'd go to play No Need to Hide for what was probably a year if not more, maybe I'm exaggerating, maybe I'm misremembering, I don't know, I would always, always, always get the flashlight in the shed and the mask on Carrot. I don't know if the odds truly are 50-50 here with the item rolling, but I swear on everything that the shed and Carrot are the more likely spawn locations of those two items. While the lunchbox tends to be underwater more, but I still feel like I get the wishing well quite more often compared to the other two items. My lunchbox! Why call it that when you can't eat it? I beg your pardon? Well, it seems very silly to call it a lunchbox when you wouldn't dream of having it for lunch. But your lunch goes in it. Your lunch goes in you, does it not? Perhaps you would like me to call you lunchbox as well. I'm not a box. Ah, too true. Maybe I'm crazy, maybe it's just the fact that I got those three locations on my first playthrough and so I just automatically assume the game's like that. I don't know how the randomization works in this game, maybe somebody out there could tell me, but in my personal experience, it just always felt like those were the most common puzzles I would encounter. So yes, I was incredibly surprised when I managed to unlock this alternate pathway much, much later in my childhood and got to witness an entire section of the mines I had never seen before. I still remember the first time I figured out how to turn the power on too, since the area starts out in complete darkness when King first rolls through it, and then cranking the gears to pull King up the ramp, which you need to go get a gear from the clock in Darkness's house by the way, ah, it was thrilling. Despite the shed pathway being much more nostalgic for me from my childhood, the mines pathway for the flashlight is my preferred pathway of the two. No, in fact, it is the best item puzzle sequence in the entire game. There is so much depth and thought put into acquiring this one item, and it doesn't feel like it overstays its welcome. It feels like it has the perfect amount of different steps that you need to take in order to acquire it. I love the mine's flashlight pathway. It is fantastic. And last but not least, there's Darkness's house, home to the fridge that hosts the carrots you need to help mount a rescue for, among many other attractions, assuming you have the carrot path. Of course, before heading into the giant house, I always like to do Darkness a favor for him and check to see if he has any mail that he needs me to grab. It's the least I can do to make up for barging into his home uninvited, after all. There's no mail, beat it. Well, all right, there's a little mail, but it's all for darkness, and it's all bills. You don't want what's in here, trust me. Now 
Oh, all right, here you go. Darkness may already have won a fabulous million dollar prize. Yeah, right. And once again, the optional conversations of this game come shining through. This was such an unnecessary addition, but Humongous went ahead and threw it in there anyways, because they sure did love their sense of humor, and I did too. I actually remember this conversation distinctly sticking out to me when I played the demo for the first time. I think the demo came with my copy of Freddy Fish 1 since I had the 1997 version, but I could be mistaken. Those demos, man, let me tell you, they really did work on me as a kid, because getting a taste of what other adventure games Humongous had created had me begging my parents to buy them for me all the time. Good times. Anyways, the solution to getting inside the house is simple. Just throw the appropriately labeled rocks into the basket so that it lifts up the cart. Wow, physics. Although, it would probably help if Sam were inside the cart first. I just absolutely love the delivery of that line. Just the blunt, wow, physics, gets me every time. Also, as another little detail of this screen, and this is something you may have already noticed, you can actually see portions of the mine track sticking out of Darkness' house in the bottom corner, as well as within that cavern with Otto. Putting two and two together, yes, these are the same pathways that can be seen while riding through the mines with King, and if you've already freed him from his rusty imprisonment, you can actually see him roll on by every so often as a little extra detail that further enhances the world that Sam's currently existing in. I love stuff like this, it gives the player a satisfying sense of progression when they witness things in the environment change as a result of something they did. I always admire when game developers go the extra mile, and I always love to highlight little things like this. It's absolutely incredible just the amount of effort that Humongous put into this game. But as for the inside of Darkness's house itself, there are a few rooms readily available for Sam to go to. First of all, there's the dancing furniture room. And I think that speaks for itself. This is also the other spawn location for Sam's mask, which gets stuck under the dancing chair's leg whenever it freezes in place as Sam enters the room. The other room of the house, as I briefly mentioned earlier, is the kitchen, and maybe this is a reference to something that I've just never understood, but for one reason or another, this place is full of a bunch of kitchen appliances that all sing as if there's some giant musical number going on. Love to cut, slice, mince, and slash. A job to run without much cash. When you click on the different items in the room, they will automatically align to the music and sing about what they're doing. Except for the fridge, which is horribly off-key. I can't let you in, but you might liberate the carrots that I'm holding for the huge green salad. There's also a cool scene where if you attempt to cook carrot while he's in your inventory, he'll actually call you out for it by speaking in rhyme, hearkening back to that one point I mentioned earlier about the exclusive optional dialogue. There's no time for playful silliness. You must keep your mind on business. We are here to stage a rescue. Sorry, um, I just meant to test you. Dude, I don't know what it is, but every single character interaction in this game just puts a smile on my face. There isn't a single one that ever really feels forgettable for me. I just love the wacky zaniness and the art style of Pajama Sam really gives off that classic animation feel that I'm always coming back for. I've said it before, and I'll say it again, these are literally playable cartoons in the purest sense, and that's what makes them great. Sure, not all of the shots in this game are on model, as this was just on the cusp of Humongous really starting to hammer home their capabilities, but all in all, it still looks good today if you ask me. Of course, in order to acquire the mask, simply hold Carrot up to the 
the fridge and you're good to go. The door will open up and you'll rescue the vegetables from their impending doom while also getting the Pajama Man mask back in Sam's possession. Also, as a word of advice, be sure to send this dumb waiter down to the lower levels because trust me, that will save you a lot of time later. Next, if you head upstairs, you'll find yourself in front of these double door game show hosts that grant Sam access to the second portion of Darkness's house, but only once you've competed on their wacky indoor Q&A game show, The, the Brain Kickler! This section is super lenient with its responses, however, so a kid wouldn't actually need to know how much rocket fuel is necessary to lift off the ground. They would just need to know that it's a lot, and that's good enough for the game. It's important to make sure that the color of the flowers by the well or the reading on the water meter have been noted before coming here, however, because Sam won't be able to progress until one of these categories has been verified. Until the player actually goes to one of these locations, the game will just present them with a bunch of, I don't know, answers. Still, after the location has been visited, the answer becomes available, Sam gets the question right, and is allowed to pass on through. Once inside, Sam is greeted to a room full of many doors. Hey, are you tired of real doors cluttering up your house where you open them and you actually go somewhere and you go into another room? Get on down to real fake doors. That's us. Fill a whole room up with them. See, watch. Check this out. Mm, won't open. Mm, won't open. Mm, not this one. Mm, not this one. None of them open. One of said doors leads to a room with the oars in them. The location of the doorknob needed to open the shack is also present here, and you can acquire a gear from the grandfather clock in the next room over once you set his hands to the correct time, and you can grab the magnet by rotating the secret door behind the bookshelf around once and then looping back up to the same room to acquire it. Needless to say, there are a lot of items to get in this section of the map, and what makes things even better is the inclusion of what is easily my most favorite meta easter egg in the entire game. Remember how I said Sam can write his own poem in one of the books here? Well, the other two clickable books next to it can lead to Sam reading various short stories embedded within the game at random. One of which just so happens to be a rather interesting reference to the initial conceptual stages of this game. For those who may not have known, Pajama Sam's original character concept was literally meant to be Pumpkinhead Boy that was ultimately changed after the suggestion of a marketing advisor who pointed out that the idea would come across as too seasonal and would likely only sell well in the autumn season. Pumpkinhead Boy, a brief tragedy. Once upon a time, there was a boy who had a pumpkin for a head. But then his lawyers told him to lose the pumpkin because they feared a lawsuit by that big guy in Atlanta and they were concerned about seasonality, so he lost the pumpkin, and then he was blue. The end. I think I've heard that story before. I guess there's also something in there about a lawsuit too, but I don't really know what that's about. But, ah oh man, I love that sort of thing. The reference to the original idea for Pajama Sam is brilliant now that I know the story behind it, because I never would have got this as a kid. I honestly don't even remember if I clicked on these books to get these stories. Honestly, I might have just discovered this recently, which just goes to show that so many years later, and there's still plenty of things about this game I don't know yet. And then of course, the last room of note inside Darkness' house is his secret lab which contains a bunch of different potions that can be mixed together to create various little visual gags for Sam. He can grow big ears, a big brain, he can get real hairy, and my favorite thing of all, extremely wealthy. Internal Revenue Service. I'm gonna have to take some of that for taxes. You can keep this moldy piece of cheese. Whoever came up with that must have had a spur of the moment stroke of genius and deserves to be loaded with all that tax money that was collected because if that isn't the most relatable thing to me now as a full grown adult, I don't know what is. Should you be given the path in which Sam's mask is on the floor with the dancing furniture, you'll need to acquire the blue potion from the top shelf by climbing up onto this red wooden chair, but by doing so the first time, Sam will accidentally break one of its legs. As such, you'll need to use the magnet to get the nail in the mines, which can easily 
easily be navigated to by opening this one-way door from the other side, and then using the hammer to hammer the nail back into the chair's leg to fix it. Of course, the magnet can also be used to acquire Sam's lunchbox if it is at the bottom of the cavern floor, and you can use the oars to push up the current to reach the well's bucket to acquire the lunchbox that way, in case I didn't mention that, depending on the location you ended up rolling for that playthrough. This is a case in which some items in the game, specifically the magnet and the hammer, are actually serving a dual purpose and being a multi-use tool. This isn't something that gets explored too much across most humongous games, which is a shame because I think there could have been a lot more exploring the possibilities of having dual purpose items like this, but it's not the end of the world. Just a thought worth putting out there. Anywho, by repairing the chair's leg, Sam can get up to the blue potion, turn invisible, hop in that dumb waiter, which I mentioned earlier is important for sending down because it can only go back up with Sam inside it, and then head back up to the kitchen so that he can sneak around into the literal living room and snag his mask without being seen. Thus, with every item in hand and Sam now being ready to take on darkness, he can head on up to the bedroom which looks awfully familiar to Sam's bedroom from the beginning of the game. Hmm, I'm inclined to believe this was intentionally done on purpose as a sort of way of bringing things back around with parallelism and tying the end of the game back up to the start. With Sam entering his closet once again after getting past the lock and key and conquering darkness once and for all. It's like poetry, it's sort of if they rhyme. Mm -hmm. Every stanza kind of rhymes with the last one. Hopefully it'll work. Joking aside, it's true. I like the way it comes full circle and it really adds to the significance of this being the grand climax, the epic showdown, the ultimate confrontation between Sam and his arch enemy, Darkness himself. I've come to vanquish you. Vanquish? Is that fun? I'm going to capture you and lock you in my signature edition all metal pajama man lunchbox. Oh dear, that doesn't sound like fun at all. Why would you want to put me in a box? So I won't have to be scared of you anymore? You're scared? I'm the one who's going to be stuck in the box. Oh dear. And it turns out he's just a big lovable guy who likes to play cheese and crackers. Going back to that situational dialogue idea that I mentioned, such as with Otto and the board, Sam actually responds to Darkness's question here of wanting to play based on whether or not the player has played it with the toaster across the bridge earlier in the game, so that's pretty cool. I like to play games. Really? Do you like to play cheese and crackers? I don't know that one. Oh, I can show you. First, we need some crackers and, and some tasty cheese. Really, do you like to play cheese and crackers? Do I? I played it with a toaster in the park. It's great. Oh, good. And so, with the two playing a round of cheese and crackers in the closet, Sam ends up pulling a fast one over Darkness, ultimately defeating him in the game. It may not have been what he initially set out to do, but he beat Darkness nevertheless and made a new friend out of it. So, really it worked out better in the end. With darkness beaten, Sam heads back to bed, calls it a night, feels completely safe going to sleep with the lights off, and brings a satisfactory ending to the grand adventure that was Pajama Sam 1. Yeah, given how long I've rambled on about this game at this point, is it apparently obvious why I love it so much? Everything about it just screams peak humongous entertainment, from the storyline to the game design and all the characters in between. Every puzzle has a purpose and with two potential spawn locations for each, that provides eight different combinations to be chosen from playthrough to playthrough, which really enhances that replayability factor. No need to hide when it's dark outside takes all of the best elements of previous humongous games, improves a upon them immensely, and then expands farther on beyond that. By this point in the humongous timeline, Pajama Sam 1 has given the player the most creative freedom of any game in their entire library, and that combined with the replayability leads to an incredible game that deserves all of the praise and accolades that it gets. Right from the get-go, Pajama Sam pulls the players in with its imaginative land of darkness and iconic characters. Whenever I go through and decide to marathon playing through all of the different humongous entertainment games, this is one of the two games that I always look forward to the most. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. I could sit here and continue to hype this game up all day long, but then the video would be even longer than it already is. I've probably spent enough time on this one now, so I think it's best we go ahead and move on to the next game. After all, I've still got plenty I want to say about Pajama Sam 2 and 3. Let's go ahead and get to the next title, shall we? Sam? 
Are you all right in there? Fine, Mom. Good night. Good night, dear. <sighs> Good night, darkness. It's time to fold your socks, dear. Aw, oh, Mom. No odds, Sam. I've washed them all for you. Now it's your job to sort them out. Right away? Well, just make sure they're done before you go to school. Okay, Mom. Good night, dear. Good night, Mom. What I really need is a machine to do it for me. Yeah. Sock sorter. Sock-o-matic. Mark three. Okay, so I have a confession to make. I actually did own and play some junior arcade games when I was younger. I just initially blocked it from my memory because I think I played them once each and then never again. Yeah, they weren't really my thing. I found them a bit too repetitive for my liking and far preferred the adventure games over these side spin-off distractions that really didn't do anything for me. Like I said, my memory is a bit hazy when it comes to the Pajama Sam arcade titles, but I know for a fact I've played this before a long, long time ago because my parents had gotten it for me for some special occasion. I think it was an Easter present if I'm not mistaken, but I honestly don't remember for sure. That's enough nostalgia talk though. Looking at this from a more objective lens, Pajama Sam's Sockworks has a less than stellar presentation, especially when compared to the duo of Putt-Putt and Freddy Fish arcade titles, which had their own unique animated intro sequences with new backgrounds and new assets. Sockworks, unfortunately, just reuses Sam's room from No Need to Hide with only a handful of new animations present when he talks in his bed. The setup of the game goes like this. Sam's mother asks Sam to sort his socks, continuing the theme straight from Pajama Sam 1, almost as if this were a direct sequel to the events of that game that take place the next day. I mean, one could infer that these are the same socks he acquired while in the Land of Darkness, given the fact that they get washed at the end of that game, and there's no follow-up to it. Maybe this is the follow-up. That's what I want to believe anyways. Although, for Sam, instead of getting his sock sorting done, he decides to fall asleep and dream about a machine that can do the sorting for him, which leads into the main gameplay of the game. As with previous Junior Arcade titles, the presentation is the exact same here with many of the same features, although the Junior Helper Pad is surprisingly absent from this one, so no assistance for younger players, unfortunately. Still, the ability to create your own levels is readily available for those that are invested in that sort of thing, and I've got some good news for anyone who was a fan of the Conveyor Belt minigame from Let's Explore the Airport. This is 250 levels of the exact same thing. Whether that's good or bad, I'm sure is up to personal interpretation. However, this strikes me once again as something that got reused, but expanded upon, like I was mentioning just a moment ago. That said, the gameplay is pretty straightforward. Guide the correct colored socks to the correct colored baskets by adjusting the conveyor belts and knowing when to activate these pistons to push the socks at the correct time. Something interesting, however, is the way that Sockworks handles its levels. See, unlike the previous arcade titles which had set levels in a set order for the player to follow, Sockworks instead has a total pool of 250 individual levels, of which 100 are chosen at random for any given playthrough. So at the very least I can say there is a lot of content here, but I don't know that I could subject myself to sitting through them all. The levels do go by relatively fast, however, because they're incredibly easy, so perhaps it wouldn't take as long as I'd estimate it would, but I don't think I want to take the time to sit down and try that. I've got many, many other things to do. 
For some peculiar reason though, there is one hidden level that you can only access by using the Cheater X codename and picking level number 69 in the level selector in order to play it. I don't know why they decided to hide a random stage in the game that never gets chosen in the shuffle like this because it's not a special layout or anything, but like, come on, this had to be on purpose, right? I will compliment the different animations that play on the level select screen, however. There's a bunch of different scenarios here where Sam could either jump up and wind the machine with a key or carry a full basket of socks away. It's really cool and is easily where most of the animation budget probably went, truth be told. Strangely enough, Sam is actually voiced by E.G. Daily this time around rather than the usual Pamela Adlin. I'm not sure why this is seeing as Pamela came back to voice the character with a follow-up title, Pajama Sam 2, so it's unclear whether she was sick that day or busy with another gig when the lines were recorded and Humongous needed to get the game out on a deadline or maybe it was a cost thing, I'm, I'm not really sure. EG does a pretty good job though, she's a close sound alike considering her ability to do raspy voices is essentially what she's known for given her starring roles as Buttercup and Tommy Pickles. Solid choice honestly, and a solid imitator too. It's not identical to Pamela, but it's close enough that it isn't something that jumps out at me the way Putt Putt's eventual voice changes do. All in all, I kinda like Sockworks a lot, but it's not without its shortcomings. I think in terms of puzzle games, this one's pretty fun for fans of that particular style, and I like how the ending actually teases the second Pajama Sam game. I do gotta knock it for originality, however, because this is just a repurposed minigame from another already existing title. But yeah, as with other junior arcades, I just don't see the need to really play this without a special reason for doing so, so who knows when I'll return to Sockworks if I ever do. It was fun getting to take a look back at a game I only played once in my life prior, but it's time to move on. Next is another game that I've been excitedly looking forward to. <sighs> Whoops, I guess I must have fallen asleep. That was a great dream, but I better get to work on those socks now. Mom said to have them done before school. Hey, it's snowing like crazy out there. Yes. School will be closed for sure. Well, in that case... Thunder and lightning? Oh, maybe that's not so frightening. Enough. Pajama Sam is gonna put a stop to this thunderstorming once and for all. Next up in the series comes Pajama Sam 2, Thunder and Lightning Aren't So Frightening, an exciting new journey with a completely different aesthetic that couldn't feel more different from the first title. This time around, the game takes place in a bright, colorful environment above the clouds. Gone are the exhilarating thrills of the mines and the atmospheric underground cavern. Instead, now we have a weather factory to explore with many notable machines at work. As the title suggests, this time around, now that Sam has conquered his fear of the dark, he is attempting to conquer his fear of thunderstorms, as his current enjoyment of the latest episode of Pajama Man the Animated Series gets interrupted by a loud crack of lightning outside. The booming thunder startles poor Sam here right into his couch cushions, but he quickly decides that he's not going to let a little rainstorm interrupt his favorite TV show. Thus, after finding his cape hidden around the room, he's ready to spring into action just like his favorite superhero and confirm front the masterminds behind the thunderstorm so that they can knock it off and he can go back to enjoying television. And that's the initial setup of the game. Once again, just like the first title, I think this is a brilliant idea. Pajama Sam 2 takes the character on a completely unique and separated journey through worldwide weather, a weather corporation and production factory located high above the clouds where the weather for the entire planet Earth gets produced. This time, instead of heading in through his closet, Sam actually climbs up into the attic of his house so that he can reach high up into the sky where all of the world's weather gets made. I like this idea, I'm glad the different settings inside Sam's 
mind take place in different locations scattered about his house. I, I think that gives things a lot of personality. What's cool about Pajama Sam 2 to me though is that I distinctly remember getting this game as a Christmas present in what I believe to be was the Christmas of 2004 if memory serves? Maybe 2005? Uh, I'm fairly confident it was the year after I got my GameCube and I deliberately remember dying to get this game for such a long time. I had actually gotten Pajama Sam 3 long before Pajama Sam 2 and so this was kinda like finding the missing piece of the Millennium Puzzle for me. This was the last game I needed in the Pajama Sam series and it took like two years for me to actually get it, despite having played the demo time and time again. I even remember going to Circuit City back when that store chain was a thing and playing the demo of the game there as well at one of the kiosks that were set up. And ah oh man, now that I've started thinking about Circuit City, that nostalgia is really hitting me. That store was, for a long time, the go-to place that my dad and I would visit whenever he was going to pick up something for his stereo system or a new TV or any sort of computer game for me. It's a shame they went out of business back in 2009 because I would still be going there to this day if they were still around. Anyway, in the introductory sequence of the game, after sneaking past this security gate by hiding inside the wooden crate, Sam manages to make his way through worldwide weather by finding the ID card of a Mr. Foster Boondoggle and slipping it through the authorized personnel only steel door. This grants him access to Thunder and Lightning's control room where he attempts to challenge their decision to make it storm over his house. But upon this confrontation, he accidentally trips and flies right onto the giant red button which causes all of the machines to break down and sends the weather across the globe spiraling out of control. This probably makes you question why they have a button like that in the first place, but the scene strikes me as a little hyperbolic and either way we wouldn't have a game without some ridiculous way for the machines to break down, so I'm not bothered by it. Upon causing tornadoes in Tunisia and raining taxi cabs in Texas, Sam agrees to help Thunder and Lightning fix the weather machine so that everything can get back to normal as quickly as possible. After all, they've got a business to maintain, and the last thing they want is their corporate controller Mother Nature to come by and expel them of their titles. From here, Sam is tasked with acquiring the four missing pieces that were shaken loose. The Y-Pipe, the Velocimometer, the Snowflake Inspector, and my boy Wingnut. That's right, unlike the previous game where there were three major items to collect, this time around there are actually four, one for each major weather machine located around the facility. From there, the game opens up and once again the player is free to explore whatever nook and cranny they want at any pace and in any order that they wish. As far as progressing the franchise goes, Pajama Sam doesn't completely change things up from the first game in terms of puzzle solving and structure because the first game already had a solid foundation to begin with. Instead, it just expands on the formula in almost every way possible. Nearly all of the weather machine parts require more than one step to rescue, with each character, aside from the Y-Pipe, having what I could classify as an easy task and a hard task. For instance, Wingnut's easy task would be the scenario where he's trapped inside this maze of pipes near the sun machine, in which Sam has to shrink himself down using the shrink matic machine in the snow factory so that he can fit down the pipe and rescue him. This is a relatively simple puzzle all things considered because it only requires you to solve the entire puzzle within a limited area. At most, the crowbar would be needed to open the seal over top the pipe, so if a player shrinks down and forgets to do that, I can see it being an extra step that needs to be taken into consideration but for the most part, that scenario is relatively straightforward. Likewise, for the Velocimometer, or as the game states, Valo, which is what I'm going to be calling her from here on out, if she happens to be trapped up in the warehouse's ventilation shaft in the basement, you simply need to go to the second floor, rearrange the stacks of stock crates, and then head back down to rescue her. Both of these puzzles are relatively easy and straightforward, whereas their alternate locations definitely require a lot more steps in order to complete. Valo's hard path Pathway in particular sees the return of Carrot, who's infiltrated the weather factory undercover in order to create some sort of structural reform from the inside. What are you doing outside of the... The land of darkness? I've infiltrated the weather company here in order to expose the egregious exploitation of their workers. What? It's all about economics. 
He's noticed that the workers at this company are underappreciated, and given his fixation on radicalizing the system, he's here to make that change happen. At least he has good intentions rather than bad ones. He's disguised himself as Jersey Langston III's nose, given that he's a snowman and all, which, again, I think is a brilliant choice. Back at the corporate office, Sam needs to become a member of the boardroom in order to gain access to the key that will allow him into the restroom where he can rescue Valo. But in order to do that, he needs to answer questions correctly to prove he's bored material. I'll bet all kinds of important work gets done in here, huh? <coughs> Excuse me. Well... I guess you could say that. And can I just say how much I love the fact that the board of executives consists of a chairman and actual boards? And then the ongoing subplot about how all the members of the board want a place to sit down because they've been forced to stand the entire time, while the chairman himself, being an actual chair, attempts to push that conversation off every time it gets brought up. As an adult, this is probably the funniest portion of the entire game to me. What kid would actually get this? How come you guys don't have chairs? We should have something to sit on, but there seems to be a little problem getting that organized. All in due time. The logistics here are far too mature for them to understand the whole dynamic of a boardroom executive structure. One of the questions that the chairman asks him to explain is called Giffen's Paradox, which Sam has literally no understanding of because he has no idea what economics is, and neither did I as a kid. I mean, what kid really understands that? Even when I brought Carrot back to help me, I had no idea what was being talked about. Do you know the answer to this? Whoa, Giffen's Paradox. That's where if you take a product that's not very good and you just make it cost more money, people will buy more of it. Pretty scary, huh? Indeed, but also correct. Economics is not the most child-friendly topic out there, and most kids have, like, no understanding of what the economy is until they at least have a basic understanding of money and commerce anyways. I mean, I didn't learn about economics in detail until, like, 8th grade, although I had heard about it a little earlier than that. Still, given that Carrot recently attended a university where he took classes on this subject, as he tells Sam when the two exchange a few words, he's able to explain that Giffen's paradox in layman's terms is the scenario where if a producer raises the price of an inferior product, consumers will actually buy more of it. Following the answer of this question correctly, Sam is elected member of the board and immediately heads to the restroom while leaving Carrot in his place to represent him. And this next sequence is why Carrot became one of my all-time favorite pajama Sam characters. See you guys later! Alright! Listen up everybody, cause there are gonna be some changes around here. Oh dear. That reaction of the chairman says it all, honestly. Corporate reform. Good for some, and terrible for others. Throughout the game, or immediately if you really wanted to, Sam can return to the room to see events progress as Carrot introduces more of his reform ideas. This is very nicely presented, although I'm not sure I really understand all of it. I'm so excited that we're finally going to have something to sit on. Is all this really necessary? Things quickly seem to escalate out of control, though, as Carrot manages to usurp the chairman from the executive leader position thanks to his rallying of support from the other board members. Is that supposed to be Langston? <laughs> yeah. This can be seen the third time Sam enters the room where all of the members now are sitting in these comfy armchairs while they continue the meeting, and as you can clearly tell by the executive's face, he is not happy about it. Of course, it doesn't last long because then Carrot outright dissolves the board entirely, so who's the real mastermind here? From this moment on, the room remains the same, but at the very least Sam is now able to unlock the bathroom door and rescue Valo from being trapped on the other side, thus taking care of the wind machine's missing part. I suppose it's also worth mentioning that the restroom that Valo is trapped in is also home to a particularly infamous scene, one of the most infamous in the entirety of Humongous Entertainment's existence. Without going into detail, it depicts Sam using the toilet that's in there. Why this scene came about or what it's doing here, I have no idea, but it's there, hidden in the game's files, and I'm sure people would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge it existed. The way Pajama Sam 2 
manages to creatively satirize the office environment through all of these different creative characters really shows how intelligent the writing of this game is. That's probably the best aspect of Pajama Sam 2 if I'm being honest. The writing is so unbelievably clever, more so than the first game, and the exaggerated portrayals of the workplace gives it that extra appeal to the adult crowd. This game, out of all of them, feels like it is the most appealing game to an older audience because of that factor. Not that the other games don't have smart writing, they very much do, I mean remember the toll booth or wishing well from No Need to Hide? But the setting of this game really puts an emphasis on a relatable environment that many people can relate to, whether it's production or administration, operations or inventory. If someone's ever worked for a company, there's probably something in here for them to identify with. Personally, while the concept of a weather factor has been done in media many times, probably even in shows and movies I've never even seen before, this was my first experience with the concept and as such once again blew me away as a kid. I thought it was the coolest thing how rain was churned and bottled up by this giant machine, and how snowflakes needed to be inspected individually to make sure they were all of pristine quality. Apple Corps! Baltimore! What? Never mind. Now, in all honesty, as a kid, I'll admit, Pajama Sam 2 was my least favorite in the trilogy initially. I'm not sure if this was due to the fact that I actually got my hands on Pajama Sam 3 first and got to a year or two later in my life, but yes, for one reason or another, I didn't like this one as much. Having gone back and played it now that I'm much, much older, I'm absolutely blown away at just how many relatable moments there are in this game to situations I've encountered as a full-grown adult and the structure and gameplay stacks up even better than I remembered it. I mean, between the vice president's office to the HR and supply departments, which I can't wait to get into, gosh, just everything about this game is so impressive. Given that this is a weather factory, the game isn't afraid to lean into the fact that weather is essentially a business. You've got the board of executives, you've got Thunder and Lightning maintaining the operations, the various weather machine parts are the employees that generate the products for the company, there's a warehouse where all of the supplies are stocked, it's all here. The creative team of this game did an excellent job of taking a work environment and making it fun for kids to explore, despite it being a very adult-focused setting when comparing it to the real world. And speaking of work environments, the Certified Snowflake Inspector is a particularly interesting one because unlike all of the other weather machine parts, this one is the only instance whose character changes depending on which scenario the player rolls for their given playthrough. In one scenario, he's trapped on the roof of the warehouse by this mini dust devil that won't let him pass, and under this circumstance he's desperate to get back to his place of work because he misses it dearly. However, if the player rolls the other pathway, the inspector is actually hidden somewhere around worldwide weather and Sam needs to recruit his trusty snowflake inspector detector, or SID for short, so that the two can locate him. After feeding him some certified sun in a can of course. Here, have some sun! <laughs> oh. Thanks! That hit the spot! Dude, what would sunlight in a can even taste like? The power pack taste of Sunny D. What's interesting to me is that Sid can actually be in one of two rooms when you start the game, and the inspector himself could be hidden in one of three potential locations which adds even more replayability, as minor as that might be. Upon finding him this time around, he claims he feels unappreciated at his job and doesn't want to go back because he feels like everybody there overlooks him. You've got to come back to the snow machine with us right away! No way! No way? I'm not going back there. They don't appreciate me. I'll be glad to get back to work after that. Can I give you a lift back to the snow machine? Thanks, Sam. That would be nice. I find this choice pretty interesting, all things considered, because it changes the player's perception of the character. No other part in the game does this. It's exclusive to him, so it certainly makes him stand out more as a character, for sure. Last but not least, there's the Y pipe, my personal favorite of all the missing weather parts. Why? Because he's got this gimmick where he asks why to everything Sam says to him, and I just find that humorous. Why? Because it's funny to me how Sam just keeps getting let on by this guy over and over without the realization of what he's doing, and again, it's fitting for his character. Why? Because, oh wait, now I'm doing it. 
Yes, yes, I was always that kid when I was younger who thought it was funny to just say why over and over again to annoy people, and I'm pretty sure I got it from this game. <laughs> Glad I got over that though as I matured, that's for sure. One situation has him trapped in a vending machine, so obviously in order to rescue him, you need to purchase him with some coins. Of course, in order to do this, you need to find some money, and lo and behold, this is where the weather generator room comes in. Wedged in between the wind and snow factories lies this greenhouse look room where Sam can generate various things such as a banana to act as Jersey Langston III's new nose, or an apple for another character that I haven't introduced yet. This machine can also generate gold coins, which can be used to purchase the Y-pipe or cheese giblets from the vending machine depending on the playthrough. Not to be confused with cheese squigglies from the Putt-Putt series, although that's a severe missed opportunity to tie in a Putt-Putt reference to this game. and. That's the strangest thing, too. Despite all of the references to Pajama Sam 1 here, there are hardly any references to any other humongous entertainment franchises in this game. Freddy Fish, Putt Putt, Spy Fox, either I have just not found anything or they aren't nearly as prevalent in this title compared to other junior adventure games. It's not the end of the world, but a little disappointing. Though I suppose this is also a good time to mention that Pajama Sam 2 is the first ever junior adventure game to let the player choose what play through they want to have for a particular game. What's unfortunate, however, is that despite the game potentially having 16 pathways or even 32 if you want to consider the three different locations for the inspector, the game can only support six in total due to the way certain puzzles can overlap thanks to multi-use items. Yep, it seems my positive appraisal of them in the first game actually ended up creating a detriment to the second by introducing this limitation. For instance, the vending machine. If the Y-pipe is trapped in there, then it's not possible to obtain these cheese giblets because the player can only get the two golden coins once per playthrough. Thus, Wingnut can never be in the rain machine in the same playthrough as the Y-pipe in the vending machine because it would be impossible to ever obtain the rubber band. This isn't a huge detriment to the game, but it does limit the number of possible combinations that the missing parts could be in. Still, six is better than one, so I won't complain any longer. The other Y-Pipe scenario has him trapped in Foster Boondoggle's locker. I have no idea who this Foster Boondoggle is or why his name keeps coming up in the game because you can never actually speak with the guy, but according to the files that you need to go through in order to obtain the locker combination, he's a dry erase marker of some sort. I don't know why he has a locker at the wind factory of all places given that he's an office supply, but hey, I don't judge. As a reminder, Foster Boondoggle is that owner of the ID that Sam finds at the beginning of the game, so I don't know if this guy's just all over the place or what, but maybe that explains why we don't ever see him. He's stuck with Bill Gate out at the entrance to World Wide Weather because he can't get in without his ID. That's my theory anyways, and I'm sticking to it. And yes, the security gate's name is Bill Gate, as shown by his employee file inside George Someone's room. And George Someone, that's another character with an interesting story. In Thunder and Lightning's control room, there sits a clipboard with a phone number on it to schedule an appointment. Upon dialing this number, Sam asks to see someone, and the secretary pencils him in for a meeting with Mr. George Someone. Worldwide weather, how may I help you? I'd like to make an appointment to see someone. Certainly, let me check his calendar. Yes, Mr. Someone is available immediately. I'll pencil you in. What is your name? I'm Pajama Sam! I'm Very helping- good, Mr. Sam. Mr. Someone will see you just as soon as you arrive. Goodbye. This joke completely flew over my head the first time I played the game as a kid and had no idea what was going on, but yes, the HR administrator of Worldwide Weather is a staple remover literally named George Someone, and for one reason or another, this dude is obsessed with apples. Hey, have you ever listened to the sound a nice crisp apple makes when you bite it? It's the music of the garden, that sound. I guess you like apples a lot, huh? Yeah. I mean, obsessed with apples. Are you enjoying that apple? Oh, yes. So you give him the apple and he leaves the room for you to snoop through the employee files and find Foster Boondoggle's birth date, which also acts as the combination to his locker, which is told to you by the locker next to Foster's in the wind factory, so I guess these lockers are sentient too. What's interesting though is that you can see profiles on nearly all of the employees at the weather factory, as well as see what their favorite food and color is. A little detail I really like is how it mentions that Thunder's favorite food is donuts, which is actually displayed inside the weather control room. Hey, is that a donut? Yes, it's a donut. No, you can't have it. 
Again, it's the little details that go a long way, and this game, much like the first, is chock full of things like that. Other details include the paranoid supply clerk, Andrew Glimmer, who's afraid Mr. Someone sent Sam over to his office to check up on him. And it makes perfect sense. Of course a stapler would be afraid of a staple remover, so it's totally in character for this guy to feel threatened by his fellow employee. George Someone isn't a bad guy, at least based on the interactions he has with Sam, but Andrew is just in this constant fear based on principle. And I love his nervous quirk where he spontaneously crunches down and spits out a bent staple every so often. Oh my, oh my, oh my, oh my, oh my. No P76 slash Z. Oh boy, oh boy. It's such a clever way to depict the body language of this character simply based on the anatomy of a stapler. Personification at its finest, something Humongous Entertainment truly shines at. His shaking and shifting eyes back and forth, coupled by this spontaneous knee-jerk reaction, just enhances the emotion you get out of this character. Once again, Humongous is proving that they really know how to bring a character to life. This office is where you can either get the employee of the month ribbon needed to make the inspector feel appreciated, or it could be the home to the rubber bands needed to free Wingnut from his watery prison should the player roll the alternate pathway for him. The process of getting a rubber band is a bit ludicrous, however, given that, because this is a formal operation, Sam needs to acquire the proper paperwork in order to obtain one from the company's supply. This takes him to the vice president's office, where a rock, similar to the ones located around the Land of Darkness, is currently residing. Thus, it becomes an objective to get that rock to move. And speaking of the Land of Darkness, there are loads of references to the first game scattered throughout Pajama Sam 2. The corporate office is full of paintings on the walls showing things like Otto, King, the dancing furniture. Is he gone yet? Then there's obviously the rock in the VP's room. There's also a mini game where Sam can use these binoculars located on the roof of the warehouse to look out into the land of darkness. It's a nice distraction where the player can search around and look for Sam's 10 comic books that he must have left there the last time he visited. And of course, there are also loads of clickable characters and objectives to view as well. It's a neat callback, probably the most callback heavy of any junior adventure game if I'm being honest to games in its own series, that is. Otto also shows up during the end credit sequence as well, and Darkness is even one of the possible puzzles you can solve in this game. Speaking of callbacks, I distinctly remember the playthrough I rolled on my first ever experience featured Wingnut in the pipes, Valo in the basement, needing the detector to find the inspector, and the Y-pipe in the vending machine. Oh, and the trend of having an optional collectible scattered around worldwide weather continues in this game in the form of Sam's puzzle pieces. Instead of dirty socks that are scattered about, Sam's puzzle is the collectible of this game. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the puzzle pieces the player collects are intended to be part of the same puzzle he accidentally scattered at the beginning of the game when he got scared by the bolt of lightning. It's neat, but it functions the same way as the last game, so not much else has changed there. Still, it's a staple of the franchise, so I at least wanted to give brief mention to it. Last but not least, there's the story progression of this game, which has a neat method of continuing on as Sam reaches each milestone of returning a machine part to their corresponding factory. Thunder and Lightning pop up with updates after each piece is returned to its rightful place, thanking Sam for his help once again and letting him know that the weather is starting to return to normal. That is, until Sam replaces the third weather piece because Mother Nature catches wind of things going wrong and states that she is on her way to the weather factory that instant. At this rate, we'll have everything shipshape before anyone even notices anything was wrong. Hang on for a second, Sam. That's our call waiting. Mother, Mother Nature. Nature! What on earth is going on over there? Eep! Uh, nothing. Everything's under control. Don't hand me that claptrap. I read your incident report. You left out one or two things. Uh, what things would those be? Well, for example, why isn't it raining in the rainforests? My plants are wilting. This creates a sense of urgency to get the last piece in place, although there isn't actually a time limit of any sort not to worry, but upon fixing the last machine, Mother Nature arrives at Worldwide Weather to check up on any strange phenomenon that could be occurring. What's this? <laughs> Mother Nature, you haven't seen my slides on my trip to Cleveland. I'll try to live with the disappointment. 
No, please, I, I do want to hear about this trip to Cleveland. Humor me. And why Cleveland? It's just so random. I love it. <laughs> Anyways, thanks to Sam's heroism, he was able to put the last piece in the proper place and everything returns to normal before Mother Nature has a chance to see, thus saving the day and returning the world's wide weather back to normal. Good on you, Sam. Good on you. Thus, the game comes to a close and the player is treated to a neat credit sequence in which these nine different monitors, which mimic the same video feed in the control room, show a bunch of different gags including various weather-related characters and activities. And that brings Pajama Sam 2 to a close. Like I said, man, I have a lot to say about Pajama Sam games, far more than the likes of Putt-Putt and Freddy Fish, and I just can't help it. These games just have far more substance to them, I find. There's a reason the Pajama Sam franchise stands out above the rest and it's for the very reasons I've been discussing with the past two adventure titles. Pajama Sam 1 was clearly a hit and Pajama Sam 2 is a very worthy follow-up to the first game in every possible way. Better puzzle structure, better animation, incredible character design and personalities, a highly imaginative environment to explore, it's all there. I may still view No Need to Hide as my all-time favorite, but I've definitely grown a fonder attachment to Thunder and Lightning now that I've revisited it again all these years later. The environments are still great, the puzzles are top-notch, the character design explodes with personality, the animation is of the quality you'd expect from a humongous game in 1998, and the voice acting is still as solid as ever, with Pamela Adlin really finding her voice metaphorically, and literally speaking, for Sam in this game. I can definitely tell she got very familiar and comfortable voicing Sam for Thunder and Lightning after having the experience of the first adventure title. All in all, this is a solid game, without question. Absolutely would recommend. How would you like to take the controls for a little while? Me? Control the weather? Sure! <laughs> this controls how much rain there is. And this one is a volume control for the Oh boy! Sam? Are you cleaning your room? I was just about to get started, Mom! I really need you to finish that up for me, alright? Thank you. Boy, I have a lot of work to do. I don't know where all my stuff even is. It could be anywhere. This looks like a job for... <laughs> Well, I suppose I should get started. So unlike the Putt-Putt and Freddy Fish Jr. arcade titles, the Pajama Sam and Spy Fox arcade games were not released at the same time together. Instead, Pajama Sam's Lost and Found ended up getting released in between Pajama Sam 2 and 3, and as a result ditches a lot of the staple Jr. arcade user interface standards that all of the previous games had. In fact, this is the first arcade title to abandon that format altogether, seeing as Cheese Chase was the Jr. arcade game right before this one, and the final one to use it. Now, instead we've got a unique menu and title screen which actually plays while you navigate it. There's still many familiar options available, but noticeably lacking is the create your own level editor which does not exist for this game. Although that's not a huge loss for me personally. This time around we have a more original opening cutscene which establishes Sam's mother returning to his room once again to tell Sam he needs to clean up the giant mess he's made and he agrees to do so but ends up getting sucked back under his bed to go to the land of darkness which I fully welcome because, well, duh. Hi Otto! It's great to see you again! You too, Sam. To what do I owe the pleasure of your company? I need to clean my room, and there are some things that are missing that I just know drop down here. Say no more. Let's see if we can track them down. And thus, Sam finds himself reunited with Otto again as the two of them traverse the land together in search for all of Sam's stuff. This time around, instead of controlling conveyor belts, the mouse is used to guide Sam and Otto along the screen in a similar fashion to that of Putt-Putt in balloon rama although this time around Sam's speed is based on what side of the screen you have the mouse currently on. Seeing as the game scrolls from left to right, the right side causes Sam to speed up a bit while the left is slowed down. Clicking the mouse buttons causes Otto to jump up in the air with the duration being controlled by how long the player holds down the mouse button. From there, the gameplay is simple, avoid the hazard collect the items and snag some points and bonus puzzle pieces along the way. And believe me, Sam will make it very known when you collect a bonus puzzle piece. I picked up a bonus puzzle piece. I picked up a bonus puzzle piece. 
The game also throws some power-ups into the mix as well, including a wing power-up which gives Sam an auto-temporary flight, and an invincibility which makes him immune to all obstacles. Other vehicles do get unlocked in the game as you progress throughout, such as King, a wagon, and the forklift vehicle from Pajama Sam 2, but other than some cosmetic changes, they really don't have any effect on changing the core gameplay. Think similar to Spy Fox and Cheese Chase. There are also three bonus games in the game as well, a card flip memorization, a catch the fall items game, and a reaction-based game, all of which are pretty suitable for netting a high score. If that's something that matters to you, then getting the bonus game on every single stage is the key to securing the highest point total possible, although be prepared to get sick and tired of doing the same minigame over and over again in order to do so. I'm sure somebody out there has or will do it at some point, but it ain't gonna be me. I have things to do, like mess around with the graphics by entering the crazy password. To start again, click here. Hi, Otto. It's I don't know who thought this was a good idea, but somebody at Humongous thought it would be funny to break reality and cause all of the game's background layers to sway independently from one another. It's novel at first, but I feel like I'm on a trip while I play and my head can only handle so much of that. Ultimately, the high score I got wasn't anything that took me too long to achieve and anyone who actually goes through the entire game would be able to beat it no problem, but it was cool seeing the other names on the leaderboard screen be named after other Humongous characters. As with Sockworks, I know for a fact that I owned this game as a kid, but I only played it once because it didn't live up to the adventure game titles I was used to, and so I hardly experienced it. I don't know if I misplaced these games somewhere over the years or if my parents sold them at some point, but I unfortunately no longer have the discs to prove it, so sadly that tiny piece of my childhood is lost forever. But it's kind of ironic now that I think about it given the title of the game. Perhaps it was meant to be. Who knows? All I do know is that Lost and Found is a pretty good arcade game. Would recommend to at least avid fans of Pajama Sam. It was cool getting to see the Land of Darkness again, so diehard Pajama Sam fans like myself are sure to get a kick out of that, but to just a casual player, I suppose that's more difficult to judge. Ta da! Sam, are you done yet? Uh, yeah, Mom! I'm just finishing up! Well, you'd better get out here and get some dessert then. Oh boy, dessert! You know, maybe from now on I should just put my stuff away all the time, so I wouldn't have to go looking for it. But it was kind of fun, wasn't it? I can hardly wait! Sam! It's almost time for dinner! Dinner? Oh boy, I don't feel so good. Uh-oh, I don't think that was me. and now they've gone to cause trouble somewhere else. Somebody's got to stop them. Somebody like... Pajama Sam! Of course, I'll need my cape. And thus, we arrive to the final entry in the original trilogy of Pajama Sam games, marking the end for many things in the series. Creative ideas, good game design, Pamela Adlin is the voice of Sam, and much, much more. Pajama Sam 3, you are what you eat from your head to your feet. Now, once again, this is another one of those humongous games where I don't remember how or when I got it, although I feel like my dad just brought this one home for me out of the blue for no real occasion. I know I can recall obtaining games like Putt-Putt Saves the Zoo, Pajama 
Pajama Sam 2 and Freddy Fish 5, but other entries like this one are just a blur to me. Oh, I didn't mention it during the Freddy Fish 3 section, by the way, but I actually obtained that game from Circuit City of all places back before that chain went out of business. But enough about that, despite me not remembering how I first got the game, I know for a fact I own Pajama Sam 3 before I own 2, and thus have played this game several more times than the second. And you know, this kind of saddens me, but I actually like this game less now than I did when I was younger, and so far this is the only humongous game I've encountered where I can actually say that. It's strange, but after playing through 1 and 2 with a more critical lens, I've noticed that You Are What You Eat is essentially just an inferior version of Thunder and Lightning in a lot of ways. There aren't too many similarities to one here, aside from using a vehicle to traverse up a river I suppose, but it's dominantly based around the exact same structure as 2. We'll see examples of that as I go along, but first I want to introduce the basic plot of the game. Just how No Need to Hide was focused around the fear of the dark and Thunder and Lightning was the fear of… well, that, You Are What You Eat is now centered around the fear of healthy foods. Okay, phrasing it like that might be a bit of a stretch, but basically it's focused on food with the intended goal of teaching kids about all the different food groups and encouraging them to be smart about what they put into their body while also not being afraid to try new things. After all, a very common fear in young children is the fear of liking something that they haven't tried before. The opening is a standard Pajama Sam tutorial room. Click around to find Sam's cape so that he can be prepared to take on whatever lies before him. In this case, the 20th box of cookies that fled from Sam and went to hide in the pantry. Getting this out of the way now, the traditional collectible of this game comes in the form of these box tops. There are exactly 20 scattered around the game, and if you find them all, then Sam receives a Pajama Man action figure with elbow thrust, which doesn't do anything in-game except unlock special images in the credit sequence that aren't visible otherwise. Otherwise. That's cool, but as per usual, it's not required to beat the game, so it's entirely up to the player whether or not they choose to go for this. Just make sure you don't miss the first two in the party room or jail cell, because otherwise, you've just locked yourself out of getting it. But yes, the box of cookies fled into the pantry and Sam goes after them, only to get trapped in the dark and carried off by the cookies to a sugar and sweets political party located on Mop Top Island. What? And when I say political party, I mean a literal party. Whoa! Oh boy! A party! Wow, is this party for me? I think you spelled my name wrong. How's that? On the sign, Sam should only have one S. Oh, that? Oh, that's S-S-A-M. It stands for Snacks and Sweets Aggressive Majority. Oh. Yes, the Sugar and Sweets Aggressive Majority, a radicalist political movement comprised of unhealthy foods with the intent of taking over the island and overthrowing all of the other food groups. Of course, this is completely lost on Sam, seeing as he has no idea what a political party actually is, so his own interpretation of that is an actual party as dictated by his imagination. Because, as with the previous two games, this adventure is all taking place in Sam's overactive imagination, this time with things going on within his house his pantry of all places. Does your party have some kind of master plan? How should I know? I'm just an ice cream cone, but it would probably involve brute force. Most good plans do. One small detail I appreciate about this opening room is that Sam can actually eat the snacks set out on the table over to the right while making different comments about how good each thing tastes. Then, of course, there's also the giant slice of cake blocking the door that Sam needs to get out of the way by eating the entire thing all by himself, knocking the wind completely out of him and sending a wave of discomfort hurtling straight for his gut. If you click on the snack table again after eating said cake, Sam's dialogue will actually change from the high energy and enjoyment to nauseous displeasure. Mmm, peppermint! Ugh. 
It's a really small detail that again emphasizes the importance that cause and effect has in these games, and it's one of those optional dialogue sequences that I have praised way too much in this video already. Upon announcing his departure, he states that he's late for dinner and doesn't want to spoil it, but the sweets don't take too kindly to that sort of language and throw him in jail because he's a traitor. But that doesn't last long because he manages to escape the prison cell with Florette, the vegetable delegate of the peace conference that's supposed to be held at the food pyramid that night. After closely encountering some sweet troops and making their way up to the food pyramid, Sam enters the central chambers and notices Carrot rushing into the other room where Army General Beatfoot is currently plotting a plan of attack against the radicalist sweet troops that are attempting to take over Mop Top Island as it's established in this scene. The folks who live on Mop Top are all foods, right? The fats and sweets group is taken over. There's just so many of them. They're causing problems all over the island. General Beatfoot wants to declare war on them. That doesn't sound very good. She got that right. So, I've organized a peace conference. It is during this exposition dump that we come to find out that Carrot organized a peace conference amongst the six major food groups so that a representative of each group could come sit down and talk things out to compromise rather than fight against one another. Unfortunately though, four of the six delegates are missing. Florette is one of the delegates who Sam has already helped to arrive, and the other is Luke Wigglebig, a sophisticated lollipop character whose ideals don't align with that radical sweets group Group that wants to take over the island. Speaking of the island, one really cool detail that I never even noticed until I became much older is that the Isle of Mop Top is actually framed after Sam's own body, with the different segments of the island representing his head, torso, and legs. That's actually a really clever detail, and as you come to discover by traversing down the different segments of the island, this is accurately reflected in the geography of each location too. Upon leaving the food pyramid and continuing down the path, Sam is led to an area with quite a few different pathways to take, as well as the site of a donut that's currently hanging from a tree as a swing. Whoop! Oh my! It's a good thing I can float. Say, the water is very nice today. This donut here is none other than Sprinkle, the primary form of traversal in the game and admittedly nowhere near as memorable as Otto or King. For me personally anyways. I think the main reason for this is that unlike the vehicle characters from Pajama Sam 1, Sprinkle here doesn't really have any plight or problem that Sam needs to assist her with. She just likes swimming and that's kind of her only distinguishing character trait, whereas Otto was this nervous second guesser that you had to convince all the time while King was a thrill-seeking adrenaline junkie. Sprinkle is is just plain, honestly. But getting back to the island's environment. The starting area that Sam is on is the top island, based around his big ol' noggin. This is represented in the environment by the neurons located at the first nexus, as well as the eyes in the telescope, the teeth that make up the mountains, so on and so forth. The other regions then consist of the foothills, which has more mountains in the shape of toes, Muscle Beach, which is based around Sam's arms and represented by the bodybuilders that power the Ferris wheel, as well as this comedy club, which is a clever tie-in to the funny bone located near both elbows, and then and there's the last section which I think is the smartest one of all. The Stomach, which features a bunch of dancing soda cans bopping to a sick beat with a giant disco ball, and what is easily the most ingenious room of the entire game. Nay, the entire series. Hey look! I've got a plunger now! Would it be okay if I touched the wrench? That's a real nice plunger. Real nice. Always nice to meet a fellow plumber. Folks call me scissors. This is paper. And that's rock over there. I'm Pajama Sam. It's a pleasure, Sam. Likewise. Yeah. No kid is going to pick up on this their first time playing. I find it very hard to believe, all things considered. But as an adult seeing this room, I was just blown away by how clever this is. This is a room that consists of three plumbers. Which are actual plums, by the way. Clever pun. But it goes deeper than that when you start to realize that in order to reach this room, you have to exit the stomach, which was connected to the esophagus in the first room. This room is Sam's bowels, where the pipes are currently backed up by something. What are plums really good at doing for the body? Yeah, suddenly seeing these plumbers work on fixing a backed up sink gives this room entirely new meaning. And, oh my god, 
what is this doing in a kid's game? But yes, as far as the environment of this game goes, it's really creative and does an excellent job of taking the human body and morphing various attributes of it into an actual explorable world without just doing a fantastic voyage type scenario. Sam actually isn't inside a human body, he isn't shrinking down or anything like that, it's just a land inspired by anatomy which I think gives it a more unique appeal, and using the heart as the primary centerpiece that branches off into various other parts of the body was a smart idea too because it treats it like the central hub of sorts, just like the real organ is in the body. Again, teaching kids about the body and foods through subtlety rather than lecturing goes a long way, and while some of the body parts are more obvious than others, there are some subtle ones too that an older audience is way more likely to pick up on. As far as the puzzles of the game go, as I mentioned earlier, it just feels like a lesser version of Thunder and Lightning. Pajama Sam 3 is not a bad game in any sense of the word, but I've noticed that this title is the exact same blueprint as the previous game done again without making many advancements in the forward direction. It's still a fine and fun enough game, but it lacks that aspect of expansion that 2 had off of 1. Just like Thunder and Lightning, You Are What You Eat has 4 delegates that Sam needs to rescue with two alternate sets of puzzles for each, but unlike three at the very least, none of them are dependent on each other, so you can combine any of the options into a set of four for our particular playthrough by accessing the options menu in the bottom left corner. Strangely enough, Pajama Sam 2 and 3 are the only humongous entertainment games period that allow you to do this. All other titles rely purely on luck of the roll when the game is booted up in order to get to a particular path. I'm not sure why other humongous games didn't do this once Pajama Sam 2 introduced it, but I suppose that will just remain a mystery. One other downside to 3's Puzzles Over 2 is that all of the delegates are found in the exact same locations no matter which of the two puzzle sets is chosen for a given playthrough. Granny Smythe will always be in the stomach, whether it's trapped in a caramel cesspool or being forcefully bounced around by the dancing soda cans like a beach ball. Pierre Lapin will always be trapped at the carnival, either on the ferris wheel or in the prize box, and the solution for rescuing both is essentially the same thing with a minor variation. Hit the bell of the test your strength game. It's just the means of doing that that changes. Either water the cauliflower using the hose which needs tighten with the plumber's wrench, or untie this green bean shoes. Hey, those are nice! Oops. Darn these laces, they're always coming undone. Here kid, hold these for me, would you? Okay. Whoops. Um... In the scenario where Granny Smythe is being bounced around the stomach, Sam first needs to assist the dancing celery stalk sister by getting her a pair of dancing shoes, which can be acquired from the banana comedian who fails miserably when you first discover him at the Funny Bone Comedy Club. Next up is Tom Rutabaga, the Knock Knock King. How about a nice hand for Mickey Hollandaise, folks? Funny story about this place, actually. So, in this scenario where Sam needs to get his comedically large-sized shoes, first he has to help Mickey Hollandaise reorganize his comedy cards that he uses to remember his routine because he's not very good at memorization. When I was in, oh, I don't know, second grade maybe, I participated in a talent show in which my talent was comedy. Of course, being a stupid eight-year-old, I decided to rip my material right out of this game, and so the five joke cards that you see here on screen right now were the exact jokes I recited at that talent show. Oh yeah, and here's one of the deeper mysteries. What can you use to make a salad, build a boat, and brush your teeth? Lettuce, wood, and a toothbrush! Ugh, I still remember standing up in front of that crowd and reading these off, and man do I cringe every time I think about it. It was a great idea in my head, but in retrospect, wow, these jokes were not that funny, and I still remember everyone in the crowd forcing themselves to give me a pity laugh because I was a stupid eight-year-old boy. Ugh. Anyways, Sam can also acquire this pumpkin, which is thrown at Mickey here, to use to get into the observatory, which is being blocked by gourds. No, I didn't misspeak. I said gourds. Um, look a sweet potato! Where is that? I don't see anybody. Oh, hello, sir! 
Funnily enough, this is actually a reference to Sam's origins as Pumpkinhead Boy, as the solution to getting past these guys is to put that pumpkin on Sam's head and walk on through. It's a really cool callback that only people who know about the character's origins would notice while still being cleverly implemented into the puzzles and theming of the game. And then there's Bean 47, a kidney bean that thankfully has nothing to do with Camp Laszlo. So in one of the potential scenarios, Bean 47 is trapped on this crane and can't get down because the kidney beans and the jelly beans are on strike against one another because they each feel unappreciated and disrespected by the other. The solution to this puzzle is actually really simple, almost effortless even. Speak with the foreman, have him do a head count of all the beans, and switch the picket signs while nobody's looking so that the beans read each other's signs and get tricked into thinking the other group likes them. Boom. Done candidate rescued. It's simple when you know the solution and doesn't require you to traverse anywhere else around Mop Top Island. This puzzle is completely isolated all by its lonesome. However, I as a kid had no idea what to do here. I got stuck on this puzzle for days without any idea for what to do to the point that I had to tell my dad I was stuck and couldn't get past it. I mean, he was able to solve the Eddie the Eel puzzle for me in Freddy Fish 1 a few years ago, why couldn't he do the same here? So he told me to save my game and he would let me know the next day. The following day he comes home from work and tells me to switch the signs when they aren't looking. I do just that, the puzzle gets solved, I rescue Bean 47, and hug my dad. That's probably my second fondest memory I have of my father in Humongous Games. I still remember it clear as day despite it being nearly two decades ago at the time this video was made. One thing I suppose I didn't mention during Pajama Sam 1, if I'm going to bring my father back into this conversation, was that he was the one who taught me how to save my game. See, given that Humongous Entertainment games were only played with a computer mouse and they didn't come with any in-game instructions on how to save your game, to my knowledge, I was also very young and wasn't fully capable of reading the English language just yet, I never had the idea or compulsion to press the buttons on my keyboard and thus, I never knew that it was even possible. For a few years, I thought I had to beat the entire thing in one sitting, and so there were many, many times where I'd get a certain way through a game before I had to turn it off without beating it. My dad was the first one who taught me that pressing the S key saves your game and pressing L loads it. And this is applicable to most junior adventure games, to a certain point in time anyways. Instantly, the pressure of having to finish a game in one sitting was gone. Tying this back into three, for one reason or another, these shortcuts were removed for this title in particular, and instead you are forced to go through the computer icon at the bottom left of Sam's inventory in order to save and load your game. The same feature was also present in Pajama Sam 2, the Spy Fox series, and many of the later Putt-Putt and Freddy Fish titles as well. Pressing buttons on the keyboard in the games that have this option implemented will instead activate click points around the room as a substitute for having to find them via clicking. Just a small tangent that I wanted to go on really quick before I got back into the main game. As for the other Bean 47 puzzle, you're actually required to use this sorting machine to sort between the kidney beans and jelly beans until you find the magical Bean 47 somewhere amongst the mix. Now, personally, I really liked this as a kid, but my opinion has certainly changed since then because this sorting minigame was actually very monotonous after the first dozen beans or so. You get the idea really quickly, and if you line everything up like the way I have on screen right now, all you have to do to sort the beans is just flick the bottom middle piece back and forth. It's extremely time consuming just to sit there and wait as you cycle through 47 beans just to complete the mission. And the logic of the puzzle doesn't even make sense either because you can just purposefully send like a bunch of kidney beans into the jelly beans pile when you're on bean number 46 and you'll still yield the same result. I get it's a game so I'm not taking this super seriously but how do the beans actually know that's bean 47 and that it wasn't one of the other five beans I made Sam purposely mess up on? I don't know, I'm overthinking this. Anyway, in in order to get the manual to help build the counting machine, which Sam needs to get for the foreman before they can actually do the sorting, Sam needs to borrow it from the library after playing a mini game with this old onion character who Sam is supposed to avoid while he gets the book, but in my run through, the dude never left the top shelf, so that obstacle was completely obsolete in this circumstance. This almost could have been a fun minigame, but it just came up short. Upon leaving with the book, Sam gets stopped by the librarian who won't permit him from checking it out without getting a library card first. Thus, after bringing back a delightful picture that Sam gets from the carnival photo booth, she registers him with a library card and lets him check out the book on the following condition. You may keep the book for three weeks. 
after that, the fine is $400 a day. That seems like kind of a lot. Just have the book back in three weeks! Not only is that excessive, but... Hi, Freddy. Nice to see you here. I'm guessing she got trapped on land at some point and dried out or something, and now she took up a job as a librarian. Yep, that's my official canon now, and I'm sticking to it. At the very least, this mission for Bean 47 has a lot more depth to it than the alternative did, but honestly, I'd rather take the shorter, quicker pathway over this one just because of how monotonous that counting machine is. I'm sorry, it's just not a pleasant time at all. And I still remember the exact puzzle set I got when I was younger, too, I guess since I'm on the subject. Uh, my very first playthrough of this game consisted of Chuck Cheddar stuck in his hot air balloon, Pierre trapped in the prize box, Bean 47 needing to be sorted, and Granny Smythe getting bounced all around in the stomach. Speaking of Chuck Cheddar, both of his side quest chains are probably the most elaborate ones in the entire game, with one requiring Sam to free him from this hot air balloon stuck in a cotton candy cloud, and the other requiring him to meet with this fortune cookie who wants him to traverse all around the island of Mop Top to answer his three mysterious questions about cheese. Are you one of the delegates to the peace conference? I sure am! I'm Chuck Cheddar! Cheese of Adventure! Oh, and he introduces himself like that every time, too. I don't know why this fortune cookie is pondering about cheese so much, but given that this needs to be done to rescue Chuck Cheddar, it's very fitting for this particular peace delegate. It's fun, although admittedly, the fortune cookie path is the most obscure of any challenge in the game because the game doesn't give that many hints as to where the answers to these questions are located. At least, from my memory anyways. So, I could see this taking a while for a kid to figure out for the first time. Still not as hard as the beans going on strike though, I mean, at least I could figure this cheese thing out on my own eventually. But I suppose we can wrap things up now. After rescuing the final delegate from their predicament, Sam rushes back to the peace conference to find everybody arguing that their food group is better than all the rest. And after the conversation devolves into an impromptu name calling, Sam gives a speech about how foods are best when they work together to create better combinations. Sure, cheese and bread are great on their own, but a cheese sandwich is even better. Thus, Sam manages to save the day at the last second, and peace is agreed upon by all six food group delegates, restoring balance to Mop Top as General Beatfoot no longer needs to declare war. Carrot and Sam exchange a few words briefly, and that ends off Pajama Sam 3 with a boppin' credit sequence and a collage of different photos featuring Sam and the various characters throughout the game. Speaking of music, if I may take a brief aside really quick, George Sanger came back to do the soundtrack for this game and he absolutely nailed it. The composition of the main Pajama Sam theme is my favorite in the entire series, and a lot of the background music is just as catchy as prior games. There's this one song in particular that always plays when you start the game. It's a simple bass line loop in truth, but this tune in particular seems to be the one theme that's always stuck out to me the most. As an addendum, because I realized this in editing that I never actually spoke about this, Pajama Sam 3 also ended up getting a console version released exclusively on the original PlayStation 1 roughly one year after the initial PC release. This was the only humongous entertainment game to ever be released on the PlayStation 1, and the only humongous junior adventure game ever to be released on a home video game console of any kind while the company was still in operation. The Backyard Sports series obviously had a plethora of different console games released, but that's Junior Sports and falls under a completely separate category. Just wanted to throw that qualifier in there really quick to help avoid any confusion. Ultimately, You Are What You Eat from Your Head to Your Feet's PS1 port isn't anything special. It's the exact same game as before, just remapped to be playable using a PlayStation controller, although I will make a minor complaint that I wish these windows telling you to skip scenes would fade away after a while because it is obnoxious to have them on screen the entire time during every single cutscene. And I will also note that the game looks far more 
more pixelated running on a PS1 compared to a computer, especially when it comes to the different character animations. Watching this cutscene side by side using the Scum emulator and the PS1 emulator, the difference is night and day. Sure, on the PS1 some of the animations may run at a faster frame rate, but that's only because the animations are sped up. The mouth movements also look very, very jarring on the PS1 version compared to the original because it's treated like its own separate layer, but that layer is at a much higher quality. It's very strange. Instead of using a mouse to click around the screen, you instead use the D-pad buttons to navigate instead, which is far more clunky, not gonna lie, seeing as it lacks the fluidity that a computer mouse typically offers. Still, you can click around just as always as you navigate Sam through the Isle of Moptop in order to get back the four-piece delegates. And that's all there is to it. Again, nothing remarkable, but definitely a noteworthy piece of Pajama Sam 3's history. So yeah, all in all, Pajama Sam 3 is not bad. It's a serviceable entry. I just wish it did a bit more to differentiate itself from 2 in terms of the way the game was structured, because when it comes down to the puzzle solving, the previous two titles have it beat by a substantial margin. There's still plenty to like about it, it hits all the right beats that one would want from a Pajama Sam game, it just doesn't do as much to progress the series in any one one direction. I hereby officially and irrevocably declare... Peace. Hooray! Great speech, Sam. You really saved the day with that one. I'm glad I could help. Can you stick around to help us make plans for the future? Or have you got to get home for dinner? Dinner? Oh my gosh. I forgot. <sighs> Mom said when I was done with my chores, I could play with my one-stop fun shop. I can make stuff like toys, cards, and decorations for my room. And there are activities, too. Good thing I got my room cleaned so quickly. I still have lots of time to play. Ta-da! Okay, so by this point you should get the idea in regards to what Pajama Sam's One Stop Fun Shop is. Just like the Putt-Putt and Freddy Fish counterparts, this is nothing more than a bunch of arts and crafts projects on a disc. It has the exact same projects and features as the other two variations, only with a Pajama Sam theme, so at this point, I'm probably coming across as nothing more than a broken record. I'm sure this was a fun thing for kids back in the day, but there's hardly a reason to come back to this anymore. At the very least, I could compliment the other two fun shops for having a new setting and new intro screen, but as you'll notice, this game's is literally just the bedroom from Lost and Found with poses for Sam from Pajama Sam 3. Not that it's saying much, but this one had the least amount of effort put in, so by that logic, I do have to say it's the worst one-stop fun shop. Either way, this is a title worth skipping. Click here to see more stamps. I wish I could go outside and play, but it's been raining all day. And there's nothing to do inside here. I finished all of the levels on the official Pajama Man console game, and the Pajama Man animated series is already in reruns. Hey, maybe I could play some board games! So now that we are past the time of release for Freddy Fish 5, this means that the timeline is now at a point where we are in a post-Infogrames layoff world. But Humongous wasn't at its wits end just yet. So what, pray tell, was the first game to release following this sudden shift towards the downward spiral? Pajama Sam's Games to Play on Any Day. There's the game I was looking for. So funny story, up until the making of this retrospective series, I never even knew that this game existed, let alone the fact that there was a follow-up title akin to the likes of Putt-Putt and Fatty Bear's Activity Pack from all the way back in 1994. Turns out Games to Play on Any Day is exactly that, a compilation of nine different mini-games available for the player that are, in a lot of ways, just an updated, repurposed variation of Putt-Putt and Fatty Bear's Activity Pack. You got a lot of the same games coming back again with a brand new code 
coat of animated paint. Although, a few new games also managed to sneak their way in there as well, such as Rockpile, which is just Mancala using the sentient rocks present in the Land of Darkness, and the puzzle games, which are about as basic as you can get. A lot of these games have more depth and detail to them when compared to Putt-Putt's version, and obviously with the 7 year difference and all, but aside from that there's not much new to talk about here. The games are still simple and hardly offer an experience one could get elsewhere nowadays amongst the cacophony of other takes on games like Lines and Boxes are part cheesy, but at the time this would have been a novelty for sure. Cheese and crackers though, you can't beat that. Concentration was pretty fun at the very least, seeing as there were a lot of cards to pay attention to on the highest difficulty, although my biggest complaint would be that this game's variation of checkers operates on the logic that if a jump is available, you have to take it whether or not you want to, which I've never liked. You should be free to move whatever piece you want at any point, but that's just my two cents on checkers, not that anybody cares. I suppose it's cool Humongous went the extra mile by taking the time to create an animated intro and outro cutscene of Sam being bored because it's raining outside, so he decides to get the board games out of his closet, but ends up falling into a fantasy realm in true Pajama Sam fashion. They didn't have to bother with doing this, but the fact that they did anyways just adds that extra level of respect that I have for these developers. What's also cool is that just like Fatty Bear and Putt-Putt, all of these games are hosted by Pajama Sam specific characters, whether it's Sam, Florette, Darkness, or my main man Carrot, each with their own handful of unique animations and plenty of memorable lines of dialogue. At the same time though, this is also the final appearance that these characters ever make in the series, and this is also the last time Pamela Adlin ever did the voiceover recording for Sam in a video game. This inherently means that this is the final send-off to Pajama Sam as a whole, and personally speaking, it's a very lackluster note to end on if I ever saw one. A minigame compilation isn't exactly a grand finale, but then again I guess it's better than outright killing the series with one of the worst children's adventure games ever made, right? Oh wait. Boy, those board games were a blast! What a great bunch of games! Happy Fun Squares, Cheese and Crackers, Rock Pile, and the rest, all in one place. And the great thing is, I can play them anytime I want to. Hey, it stopped raining. I was having so much fun, I didn't even notice. Hmm, maybe now I'll ride my bike over to the comic book store and buy the latest issue of the amazingly incredible adventures of Pajama Man. <laughs> See you later! ...have once again been overcome by those of good and cleanliness. For, For I, I am Pajama Man, man friend, friend of, of the, the good, good foe of, of evil. evil. Pajama Man! Man! Gee, that was an exciting episode. Pajama Man is the greatest. Oh well, I'm gonna turn off the TV. Stay tuned for an important news flash. Pajama Man fans everywhere can meet Pajama Man in person. Today only, Pajama Man will be signing autographs at a shopping mall near you. Alright, I've been trying as hard as I could to avoid mentioning this one for as long as possible, but alas, there was indeed a fourth Pajama Sam game made and released at the same time as Pep's birthday surprise. Pajama Sam 4 should be a game that, hopefully, after this retrospective series, I will never have to reference again for the rest of my life. This title exists as nothing more than a disgrace to the Pajama Sam franchise and should be thrown in a void somewhere never to be seen again. All of the issues that are present with the seventh Putt-Putt game are present here too. Below average animation, poorly delivered voiceover lines, ludicrously stupid game design, a less than stellar environment, and above all else, the lack of a theme centered around a childhood fear. At the very least, the one positive thing I can say about Life is Rough When You Lose Your Stuff is that the game doesn't re use the excessive amount of assets that Pep's birthday surprise did. In fact, all of the game's environment backgrounds and soundtrack are originally drawn, which tells me that between the two Atari titles, this game was the higher priority between them, and if I had to wager why, it's probably because the company expected Sam to sell better so they gave that game more of a budget and focus to humongous entertainment. That's just my theory, but that's Atari for ya. Wouldn't be surprised. It could come in handy at any time.
I suppose if I can give any more credit here, at least the title follows the same naming scheme as the other entries in the series, something that can't be said for the Putt-Putt title, but again, the distinct lack of a childhood fear as the baseline for the premise is just baffling. There have been three games in the franchise already that have established that this is the core idea of what gives Pajama Sam his identity. How can a fourth game just come along and ignore that, especially when there are still plenty of other childhood fears that exist out there? But other than that, yeah, no, the exact same issues I had with Pep's birthday surprise are all present here as well. Once again, despite coming out several years after Pajama Sam 3, the image quality of this game somehow manages to look worse, and the mouth movements especially look as though zero time was put into matching the characters' voices up to their lips. The primary reason for this being that Humongous had stopped using the Scum engine as the basis for all of their games and started using a newer engine instead. However, due to reasons that I'm unsure of considering that I'm not a game programmer and I'm not that technical with it, the Scum games end up looking better nowadays than these two games do. So. I guess you can see which engine aged better. And I'm just gonna get this out of the way now. Sam's actress is terribly inexperienced because she sounds nothing like a boy and the vocal inflections are laughable at best. It is clear as day that Sam is being voiced by a girl and they don't even try to emulate the same raspy tone that Pamela Adlin pulled off so well. It's just a generic voice with very poor direction. That looks like a wad of funny putty. You can do all kinds of stuff with that. I mean, very poor direction. I, I don't mean any offense to this actress, but this is some of the worst acting I've ever heard in my life. At the very least, it doesn't come across as sarcastic in any way, the way Putt-Putt did, but it doesn't sound genuine either. That's the biggest shoehorn I've ever seen. I bet it's really, really loud. And the sound quality of these lines varies so much that it just makes you wonder where they were even recording this. And don't even get me started on how the Dirty Socks voice completely changes to somebody that doesn't even sound alike when it transitions over to the song of the game. It's a sad situation. I suppose the best way to explain it is this. A sock out on his own is like a sea without a shore. And cause I got some mud on me, I can't get in my drawer. Which also feels out of place, might I add, because no other Pajama Sam game has a song sequence like this. This feels more like it belongs in a Putt-Putt game. I don't know, I have no explanation for it, and the song in question is also really, really bad. It's terrible. The music is bland, the lyrics are forgettable, there's no reason to sympathize with this guy's plight, and it hardly does anything to progress the plot forward. Just having a regular old cutscene like the ones with Carrot in prior games would have been perfectly fine to get the same point across and take less time to boot. The game would have been better off without this. And speaking of Carrot, he's nowhere to be seen in this game other than a minor cameo on Sam's bedroom poster. Shame too, he always brought something exciting to the table, but here he's completely left out, so that's disappointing. Especially because unlike the previous three entries, the character designs of this game aren't very exciting. None of these characters strike me as though they had a creative vision driving them forward the way previous games did. Which is surprising considering that when it boils down to it, the game is just like an inferior version of Pajama Sam 1. It takes place in his bedroom instead of his closet, both environments have an emphasis on Sam's belongings making up a portion of the environment, he needs to acquire his personal items in order to be access a special door at the end of the game, although that's Four's entire gimmick, whereas one it was only a small part of the greater whole, both environments take place at night and in a forest where a lot of purple, blue, and green is present. It's clear that this game doesn't take place in the Land of Darkness, so it shouldn't look like the Land of Darkness if you ask me, because that just gives it an identity crisis. While not outright reusing the assets of No Need to Hide, Life is Rough still feels like it's trying to copy a lot of the tone and atmosphere and environment that was captured in Pajama Sam 1, but it just did not live up to that same level. And with Pajama Sam 1 being my favorite in the series, you better believe I'm even more critical of this as a result. Life is Rough bothers me so much because the Pajama Sam series still had infinite potential as a franchise between the childhood fears concept and the fact that these games take place all around Sam's house. We could have had a game where Sam has to conquer his fear of monsters under the bed or Sam being home alone. And where was the game where Sam had to go down to his basement or garage? Come on, those two locations would have been the perfect premise for a game. I'm shocked that neither of those ever happened. And the title too, Life is Rough When You Lose Your Stuff? What stuff? What does that mean? I mean, sure, it follows the same scheme, but it doesn't really tell me anything. 
<sighs> well, I guess now's as good a time as any to dive into the premise of Pajama Sam 4. So, the basic plot of the game goes like this. Sam sees an advertisement on TV that states Pajama Man is going to be at his local mall that day signing autographs, so Sam eagerly rushes on over to his mom and begs her to take him so that he can get his comic book signed by Pajama Man himself. She agrees and tells him to go get ready, and wouldn't you know it, his room is a mess. He manages to find his comic book, but it somehow gets sucked down into this giant mess of clothes, and after finding his cape in the opening tutorial room sequence, he dives in after it to get it back from the evil Dr. Grime. So I guess this game's about how dirty things are bad? Don't really see how that's a fear of any kind, but hey, whatever. I guess there's a lesson tacked on here about staying clean, but it's very non-specific and hardly comes across as the point of the game because this game has no point. And does this setup sound a little familiar at all? I don't know where all my stuff even is. It could be anywhere. I wonder what might be hiding under here. Whoa! Where did this come from? I bet a lot of my stuff is down here. I gotta go get all of it. Yahoo! Oh, that's right. Pajama Sam's Lost and Found already did this. So this game isn't even original in its own premise. How about that? Not to mention that the way it handled the lesson at the end was miles better than what this game does but we'll get to that momentarily. Sam then finds himself inside this strange land, which I don't believe is ever given a name, and the rest of the plot just becomes this quest to recover Sam's comic book, which he discovers is being held at the mall inside this fantasy world. As he approaches to go in, the security guard there refuses to allow him inside until he returns with the correct clothing items, because as he puts it, <clears throat> Not so fast, kid. Do you know the rules? What rules? Ignorance of the rules is no excuse. I've got to tell you the rules now. We have a strict dress code. No shirt, no shoes, no socks, no service. Are you hip to that? Hip? Thus, Sam needs to acquire a shirt, socks, and shoes in order to enter. Except, after acquiring these items, he doesn't actually put them on. They just act as his form of identification, I guess, more than anything else. It doesn't make sense. See, at least in Freddy Fish 4, Freddy actually wore the items that she needed to get to get past the guard. No such effort was put into this here. From there, Sam branches out to find said items and returns when he has them, getting access to the mall where he then finds his comic book after earning a prize-winning ticket to skip the line to meet Dr. Grime, where he sees his comic book which somehow found its way into Dr. Grime's room. And then Sam activates the sprinkler system which cleans everything off, and then the game just cuts to everyone outside as all of the inanimate objects thanks Sam for cleaning them off and we never see Dr. Grime ever. Ah, jeez, okay. So, this plot is more shallow than a kiddie pool because the leaps and bounds that it makes to get to its conclusions are really reaching. The fact that this game builds up this mysterious Dr. Grime is the big baddie of the game, kinda like darkness, and then Sam just never encounters him at all and gets his comic book back effortlessly is such a tease and it feels so unsatisfying. I mean, I can't even imagine being a kid, constantly being told about Dr. Grime throughout the whole game and imagining what he could be like, only to find out that we never get to see him. That's the whole payoff with Pajama Sam 1. The big confrontation with Sam and Darkness, the thing that was built up all game as Sam collected the items he needed to acquire to defeat him in battle. Here the game just says, go get three articles of clothing so you can go through this door and then you win. There's no build up, there's no purpose, it's just an objective for the sake of having some objective in the game. And then there's the fact that the comic book just finds its way into Dr. Grimes' room. How? The first three games always had explanations for how things happened. Sam lost his items in No Need to Hide because the trees took them away from him and scattered them across the land. The weather machine parts in Thunder and Lightning were spread out because Sam pressed the big red button that caused them all to kind of explode. And sure, while there isn't a direct cause for the delegates being missing in You Are What You Eat, most of them can be inferred. Chuck Cheddar was likely on his way when he got his balloon stuck. Florette was thrown in jail by the Sweet Troops. Bean47 was trying to break up a strike and the other beans didn't like that and exiled him to the top of this crane where he was going to starve to death until Sam managed to save him. There's reason and thought put into how these things are placed into their predicaments. Here we don't see what's responsible for stealing the comic book and we're not given an explanation as to how on earth it got into this room. So instead of being engrossed in the story of the game, we're instead questioning the logistics of how something had taken place. And that shouldn't be happening. And 
Sure, some people might want to say, well, it's a children's game, but considering that the other three games that I had just established had explanations for how their particular items got into the situations that Sam needed to then rescue them or acquire them from, I expect the same level of thought and effort put into this game too, being that it is a part of the same exact franchise. I feel entirely justified in making this criticism. As far as the gameplay goes, I don't want to spend much longer on this, so here are my biggest complaints in short. I hate how this game buffers in between screen transitions, the previous humongous titles would never have to load from room to room, and the transitions were always seamless, you never saw the main character just freeze in place before they made it off the screen. This looks terrible, and by 2003, there was no excuse for it. I also hate how most transitions are unskippable, or at the very least can't be skipped until they're mostly over anyways because this game, like Pep's birthday surprise, is so unbearably slow that it just feels tedious trying to get to the next room over. The room layouts are also annoying, especially with this one-way cliff loop sequence where you can only get up by being launched by this spoon, and then only get down by jumping off at this specific other section which then launches you up to a different area that you then have to climb down from because you don't have the choice to just go straight down, and then the animation that you're forced to sit through to get up to the top of the cliff and to get down from it are both unskippable animations, meaning you have to sit through this every single time you want to go up there. It's agonizing. It's miserable. I've seen it once. I've seen it a million times. None of the puzzles in this game are particularly fun or interesting or thought out. They take very minimal effort to solve. And worst of all, this game doesn't even support multiple pathways. That's right. Pajama Sam 4 is the exact sequence with the same exact puzzles every time you boot up the game, which means this is yet another step backwards for Pajama Sam 4 when comparing it to the rest of the franchise because because no other Pajama Sam game, in the main line of Junior Adventures that is, was a singular pathway every time. All of the games promoted multiple puzzles for each objective and encouraged replayability. Seriously, Pajama Sam 4, by comparison to its own games, is undoubtedly the worst humongous sequel in the company's library, and I just don't see how I could get any enjoyment out of this when I know there are three superior games that completely blow this out of the water. I'll take something that's a little less ambitious like Pajama Sam 3 over some pile of crap like this any day. Honestly though, there's only so much negativity that I can put up with when it comes to the Atari titles. I know fully well that none of this is the actual humongous staff's fault given that they had proven time and time again with their past titles that they were fully capable individuals who knew how to create a genuinely enjoyable adventure game for children. Even despite the layoffs that Infogrames made in 2001, most of the people credited on this game were from titles prior to the GT Interactive buyout, so it's clear to me that this was out of their control, and I don't blame them for anything wrong with this game. I don't have a doubt in my mind that if more time, more effort, and more resources were given to them by their parent company, this would not have turned out the way that it did. There are plenty of accounts out there and plenty of evidence that prove Infogrames was not interested in Humongous's products and utterly gave them the shaft upon acquiring them, aside from the Backyard Sports titles because they made the most amount of money and that all that terrible, terrible company cared about. It's sickening, truly it is, and I have no respect for that company or those people as a result. Of course, nothing can be done about it now, what's done is done, but I just want it to be known how awful of a company Infogrames, aka Atari, truly was. That's all. Ultimately, Pajama Sam 4 is not a game worth spending any time on, and we probably would have been better off in life not getting anything at all. I just don't see how a game like this could even compare to the initial three titles, not by a long shot. Do yourself a favor, and don't bother with this. It's not worth the headache, it's not worth your time, and it's better off being left forgotten for eternity. Just go back and play the other three games instead. It is the very rare Pajama Man issue number one in mint condition in its plastic bag. Today I was going to take it to get it autographed by Pajama Man himself and... Oh my-
my gosh! I almost forgot about that! I gotta hurry and meet him before he's gone! Come on! Wait for me! That's right, Fiend, and I have some gadgets of my own! Take that! Ah, not the Illuminator Mark V! Do you have anything to say before you're sucked into my portable bad guy containment unit? I wish you'd pick up your socks once in a while. Sure thing, Mom. You can consider that done. Okay, Sam, you remember tonight's the night we go to sleep with the lights off. Don't worry about me, Mom. I'm red. And I can put on my pajama Sam mask if I get scared. That's good, dear. Good night, Sam. Good night, Mom. Freddy Fish 1 wasn't the only humongous entertainment game to get ported to the Nintendo Wii. Nope, as it turns out, Pajama Sam 1 also received the same treatment, getting renamed from No Need to Hide When It's Dark Outside to just Don't Fear the Dark, which, uh, sucks. Way to sap the fun right out of the title there, Atari. Good job. As with Freddy Fish 1, the same problems persist here with the Wii version of Pajama Sam. That scary looking place up there must be Darkness's house. I'll bet that's where I'll find him. Terribly choppy animation that stutters likely due to the way the console emulates the game combined with the most minimalistic startup screen that one could possibly imagine and Wii pointer controls for the mouse cursor which is the only novel aspect of this entire port. Otherwise, it's the exact same game as the one I had already gushed about, just inferior. There's really no reason on earth to play this game when the Steam version exists, so I wouldn't recommend this port to anybody. Unless you want it as a collector's item, there's no reason to get it. At this point, I have very little to say on this that I I didn't already exclaim during my review of Kelp Scene Mystery, so I see no reason to dwell on it any further. It's a disgrace to the art that was the original title, and I'm glad Atari was legally called out for it. End of discussion. <laughs> scary looking place up there must be Darkness's house. I'll bet that's where I'll find him. My name's Sam. I'm going to capture Darkness and put him in a metal lunchbox. I still need to find my flashlight and my lunchbox. I'd better get going. But hey, now we can move on to the Pajama Sam demos and other nifty fun facts. So, starting with Pajama Sam 1. The very first thing I want to call attention to is a bug that exists within the 1996 version of the game. Supposedly, in this room, located across the river in the Land of Darkness, there sometimes lies an invisible sock located in the top right corner of the room. And by accidentally clicking on it, the game will take you to the sock screen where you are shown to be possessing a white sock or an invisible sock. In my experience as a kid, I was lucky enough to get the white sock because the invisible sock will instantly crash the game when you click on screen. What's unfortunate, however, is that in my playthrough I had already collected most of the socks in the game and didn't have any open slots to place it in my laundry basket. That's right, I had all 10 slots filled so there was nowhere for me to place the white sock, and I was essentially stuck in a dead game that didn't crash, but I had no way of clicking out of it because I was completely locked in. <laughs> It's a funny memory looking back, but man was it inconvenient at the time because I never saved during that particular playthrough. Expanding on some fun facts about the first Pajama Sam title, in the 1999 version there was actually this weird oversight where, for whatever reason, some lines of the wishing wells were left over from the Dutch dub somehow and didn't get replaced. Wouldn't you be even better off if you made two streams? Then you'd have twice as much water. I'm Brayden, Interesting day. I'm not sure why the Dutch version of the game was chosen for the re-release rather than just using the 1996 version as the baseline to make updates too, but hey, what do I know? There's also an unused animation in which Sam attempts to use an oar to pick up his lunchbox from under the water. Of course, given that the oars can only spawn when Sam's lunchbox is next to the wishing well, it's physically impossible to view this animation on a normal playthrough. And of course, as with most humongous games, there were other files embedded in the game as well, such as storyboards and sketches for things that may or may not have ever 
gotten used. I tell you what though, if there's one thing I'm grateful for, it's the fact that we got an updated version of King's design because I don't know if I could play the minecart sequences if it had a face like that. The demo for No Need to Hide is particularly interesting though because it's one of the earliest demos I ever remember playing as a kid and is basically just a summarized version of the actual game. Sam already comes pre-equipped with his mask and it's up to the player to show Otto that wood floats in order to get his lunchbox into Oil King's wheel so that he can get his flashlight. Then from there, Sam is able to run into Darkness' house and enter his bedroom. This demo, to my knowledge, has the most screens in the game, coming in at 6 in total, tied with Putt Putt Travels Through Time. And with the various different cutscenes you can see within the demo itself, yeah, this one really shows off a lot of the game. But it was probably the most effective demo as a result, because I wanted this game so, so badly as a kid. And I remember playing this demo over and over again until I did eventually obtain it. Such a great game. It truly is. Pajama Sam 2 faces a similar situation as Pajama Sam 1. Plenty of hidden files are present in the game, and that infamous scene I shared earlier is certainly most noteworthy. Although, there's actually quite a lot of rare scenes that most players won't encounter on a standard playthrough. Heck, until I did research for this video, I didn't know that it was possible to try and hand in the ID card to the Lost and Found, or that Sam can have Carrot talk to the Snowflake Inspector. Amongst many other things, I guess there's even more obscure conversations buried deep in these games than I thought. Another interesting story is that apparently Jersey Langston III was originally supposed to be named J. Langston Popsicle III, but after doing a bit of research, one of the devs found out that Popsicle is a registered trademark and so they couldn't have that name in the game without risking legal issues. But this wasn't discovered until after the dialogue was recorded, so a bunch of the lines involving this character needed to be redubbed later on in production. I'm J. Langston Popsicle III. I'm J. Langston III. As for the demo, it primarily revolves around rescuing the Snowflake Inspector from the Dust Devil. At the very least, I can give the game credit for not just forcing the player through the intro sequence of the game the way most humongous demos started to do at this point, but it's pretty straightforward and you can only travel between two to three rooms in the warehouse area. Pajama Sam's 3 demo though, yeah, it's just the jail sequence and then the observatory is tacked on to the end for no real reason even though there's no sort of transition whatsoever between the two. It's just a relatively simple puzzle that you can get out of in 30 seconds and then another puzzle where you just put the pumpkin on your head, walk into the observatory, and then that's it. It's very disjointed, probably the strangest demo out of the whole bunch when you have played the original game to compare it to? I don't know, to me this just feels like a bad demo honestly, and I felt gypped even as a kid because this sequence doesn't tell you anything about you are what you eat. Still, there were a lot of hidden files found within this game worth checking out, so there's that at least, but yeah, as per usual, the later down the timeline we go, the less exciting demos and hidden gems there are to discuss regarding the games. Hopefully this was a fun look into some hidden easter eggs within the Pajama Sam franchise, and hopefully more cool information will be discovered down the line so that we can learn even more more about these games' developments in the future. Uh-oh, looks like this is the end. Pajama Salmon, you are what you eat from your head to your feet. See you there. All in all, the Pajama Sam series is an adventure game franchise that I hold very near and dear to my heart. All three games in the series are wonderfully exquisite adventures that I always get excited to go back to whenever I find myself in the mood to re-experience the humongous entertainment games again. Pajama Sam, without a doubt, broke new ground and had such a major impact on so many people's lives. I mean, there's a reason he's looked back on so fondly by people that were young during the mid to late 90s and early 2000s. No need to hide when it's dark outside, thunder and lightning aren't so frightening, and you are what you eat from your head to your feet are all well-crafted games that I can still recommend to anybody today, kid or adult alike. The series has truly withstood this test of time, and I can only hope that it continues to be appreciated as more time goes on. Would I love for the series to return someday? Absolutely, as I'm sure many would, but alas, it seems highly unlikely that that may ever happen. Never say never. 
just withstand an endeavor. That's my suggestion for the fifth Pajama Sam game, by the way, original title, do not steal. That said, however, next up we're moving on to a certain Volpine secret agent who may or may not rank right up there as one of the greats of Humongous Entertainment's library. Tune in next time to catch my full retrospective series of Spy Fox and the thrilling adventures that await him. Until next time, Shadow Streak, signing off. Thank you.